Hello, I'm John Carlin, the chair of Aspen Digital Cybersecurity Program, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our third and final day of the annual Aspen Cyber Summit. I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for making this week's summit possible and helping us convene in an unprecedented year where our digital security has never been more important to the way we live our lives. We would also like to acknowledge Blue Vector, SICPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support. It's particularly timely to have this summit as we both make sense of a particularly crazy and unsettling time and prepare, hopefully, for a safer future that we can work to secure together. And we're grateful to FireEye, Intel, Proofpoint, Blue Vector, SICPA NA, and the American Gas Association for understanding how important these convenings, even when virtual, can be. The full summit agenda and bios of all our speakers are available at aspencybersummit.org. We've got a great day ahead of us today, including conversations about the securing the development of COVID-19 treatments and a vaccine, about the rise of emerging technologies and government with senior leaders from the National Security Agency, NGA, and IARPA, and then the first ever public interview of the new acting director of CISA, the Department of Homeland Security's key cyber official, Brandon Wells. Then I'll be back at the end of the day for the summit's final session, a conversation with three of our top cyber security voices on Capitol Hill, Senator Mark Warner, Representative Will Hurd, and Representative Lauren Underwood. I'd also strongly encourage you today to take a look at our new report released yesterday by the Aspen Cyber Security Group that lays out a national cyber agenda for the Biden administration and the 117th Congress. It outlines actionable steps, the art of the possible, as we call it in the cyber group, to help build a more secure foundation for the internet and our digital economy. The full report is available at aspencybersummit.org, aspencybersummit.org. And many of the key voices that went into writing that report, you've heard from at the summit already, and we'll hear more from today. Now I'm pleased to introduce my friend, Dina temple Rassen from NPR, who will be speaking with uh, FBI Deputy Assistant Director, Tanya Ugaritz, J&J Chief Information Security Officer, Maureen Allison, and Eli Lilly, Chief Information Security Officer, Meredith Harper. Welcome and over to you, Dina. Yeah. Thanks very much, John. It's nice to see you, even virtually. Um, so today you have everyone's bio, so I don't think I need to re reintroduce our panel. But what they're going to offer us, I think, is a way to look at the year and back at the year in a context of cyber and healthcare, and give us a little bit of a different way to look at the latest efforts to get the vaccine out to the public. Uh, we actually have some news on this today, by the way. Uh, we'll get to that a little later. But basically, the New York Times reported that cyber attacks related to cold storage of the vaccine have been going on uh, since August, and it's unclear whether this is about ransomware or something more sinister but we'll get to that in a minute. What, what I thought we'd do is we'd divide the discussion basically into three parts. Um, we, we're gonna look at the broader issue of cyber threats and attacks on the healthcare set, sector as you know, we sort of wrestle through a pandemic. Uh, we're gonna look at the security and protection of intellectual property, property related to the vaccine. And then finally, as related to today's news about hacking the cold chain, we'll talk a little bit about the security protection and defense of the supply chain for uh, the vaccine. So what I'd like to do is, oh, and uh, if you have questions, I'll try and field those as we go along and we may have time for questions at the end as well. There's a Q and A function. I think uh, the AV team at Aspen will uh, explain how you guys need to put those questions in. And um, with that, I just wanted to start maybe with um, Meredith. I thought I would start with you. And, you know, as the, the CISO at Eli Lilly, having to deal with all that we're dealing with, but in a, in a laboratory setting, um, with laboratory people either having to be in pods or, or working remotely, are, are you dealing with more attack surfaces now than you ever had before? Because people aren't all in the same building using the same network. They're, they're all spread out. 
so much for that question. And the answer is yes. Uh, so we do have an increased um, footprint as it relates to our tax surface because we made a decision quite early in the pandemic around the March 8th timeframe to send all of our team members globally home to work. Now, there was a subset of those individuals that um, needed to touch um, specific equipment in our labs and places like that. And so we put some measures in place to be able to protect their safety while they were actually interacting with that specific lab equipment that we could not pick up and take to someone's home. So we did have um, an opportunity to still have a small portion of our team um, still going into our physical locations, but it was uh, far and through few between. Um, over 16, 17,000 of our team members were deciding to work from home based off of the, the concerns about their health and safety. So yes, the, the attack surface now has um, incrementally grown over that period of time. And we've had to continuously as an organization um, ensure that when our team members are at home working, they're still putting those security principles in practice, even if they're sitting in their own home offices. I think sometimes we can get a little lax when we're at home and we don't always think the same way if we're in our um, physical work locations, but we've, wrote, we've done, a, a, I think, a really great job of rolling out a robust um, education awareness program of how to protect and secure your spaces within your home environment. So yes, we have seen an increase of that surface and attacks as well um, because of the pandemic. So it goes beyond just double click, don't double click on that weird phishing email. It may uh, have to do with authentication of routers and things like that. Is that what you're talking about? All of that, yes. So we put together a t a, like a little packet that we could give to all of our team members to say, now when you're in your home environments, here's some of the technical controls that we recommend you have in place in order for you to continue to operate and to carry out the business of Lilly. Um, we have a VPN, so we need you to really connect to that. That offers that security to be able to still access the data that you need in order to perform your role without you um, putting that information on your local devices and things of that nature. So we gave them a, a toolkit to follow, to say, here's kind of some of the questions that you may be asking. Here's our recommendations for how to deal with that. And then we work through those things together um, to make sure that we're not seeing increased exposure. Um, one of the other things that we talked about that we um, initially, I can say we, had, we didn't really think through, I think at, at the beginning, was around the idea of printing. So we get so comfortable printing in our, our physical locations at work, but now you're starting to print things that may be confidential um, at home. And so how do you secure those printouts? How do you destroy them appropriately? So again, we tried to think of the, the full gamut of what a, a home worker would need to know in order to make sure that, them, that themselves and um, their devices and data and the things that they print are protected. So uh, you were sending out shredders and saves? So we didn't do that. So, so we did give them some opportunity to say, if you have a home shredder, here's the ones that we would recommend if you do that. Wow. One of the other things that I think we did, which I really appreciated our leadership going down this road, we knew that people will now work in these home environments. And from an ergonomics and security perspective, we gave each team member the opportunity to say, I need to outfit my workspace differently now that I'm working 100% from home. So if that meant that you needed to get a recommended shredder so you can now destroy um, documentation appropriately, if you needed to get even a new chair so you can be functionally um, comfortable as you're working every day, there was an allowance that was offered to every team member who needed to make those adjustments within their spaces. So we offered the recommendations, we gave them options and say, here's what you can pick from. And then you chose what you needed to uh, bring into your workspace to make it comfortable, but also make it secure. Yeah, NPR gave us chairs. So that's clearly, uh, <laughs> uh, that's clearly a de rigueur in this. So have your concerns, and I'll get to the other panelists as well, but uh, just have your concerns changed since March? I mean, are you seeing things that we, you know, we think about ransomware, we think about phishing attacks, but are you seeing things, is this progressing or evolving? What we're seeing is, um, and I know Ma Maureen and I've had these conversations before, um, some of the activity, I won't say probably most of the activity that we see is, is standard for us. We, this is what we typically see within our environments in terms of exposure, um, attacks, interest in our organization. Those things are happening every day, and that's no different. What I have found, though, 
is I think the use of social engineering to be able to get a foothold into an organization by way of credential stealing and things of that nature. I think we've seen more of those types of attacks and they've become a little bit more sophisticated um, than we probably have seen in the past. But that doesn't mean that the volume in terms of what we're seeing is, is shocking to us. It's kind of, it's common at this stage of the game. But I think that there, there is this turn up on um, the sophistication of it all. And if we're not training our team members appropriately to look for those indications of whether something doesn't look quite right with the message, um, we could find ourselves in a world of hurt. So we've tried to really focus a lot on the training and awareness of our team members as well during this time. And specifically, as it relates to some of our individuals working in the development and the research space, um, because we know that they will be a target. They're the ones who are actually working on um, um, our, our response to COVID. So from that perspective, we've tried to use training awareness education to thwart some of those attacks. Do you think some of the social engineering is, is working better now because people are lonely and by themselves in their homes? I don't know if it's the loneliness, um, but, <laughs> but, I, but I think, I don't know if that's the, 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 what makes them susceptible to it. But I think sometimes we are, I, I know I've done it myself. I feel like I'm working more now that I am at home. Um, right. Being able to shut off and uh, be able to disconnect is a little bit harder now because I'm sitting here in my office and I get a chance to get things done. So I think because we're moving fast and I think we're moving um, to really tick those things off of our list, that sometimes we can move a little bit too quick and may click or may open or expose our organization that way. So I don't know if it's the loneliness piece, but I do <laughs> believe that we are moving quicker probably in some instances, which cre creates more exposure for us. Right. Maybe journalists just get lonely. So <laughs> let, let me ask you, um, Maureen, let me, let me move to you. And, and one of the things that we, we know from uh, public reports is that uh, there was a hack of a number of different uh, uh, medical or healthcare companies, including Johnson & Johnson, by North Korea. And these reports came earlier this month and they were trying to steal allegedly uh, sensitive COVID information from Johnson & Johnson and others. Could you walk us through what that kind of experience is like? Well, first of all, Dana, thank you very much for the question. But I would say, let's call it an attempted hack, not a hack. Okay, fair enough. Clearly in the cybersecurity organization and in, in, in arena, those are clearly different items. Um, uh, healthcare companies literally have seen an onslaught since March 2010. Uh, that is the day that the Chinese um, actually started a hard knock of most of the healthcare in the United States. And, and there was a lot of talk at the time, those who knew that they had seen um, attacks um, or see, had seen that scan by a nation state and those who hadn't. And there was a great outreach and a great um, a pouring out, uh, working with the, uh, groups like the FBI uh, and Homeland Security on what was this all about. A lot of discussions, especially in healthcare, of what was needed in this space to secure us. Um, Meredith and I and, and all CISO in healthcare are seeing attempted um, penetrations by nation state actors, not just North Korea, every single minute of every single day. We have four primary threats that, that I try to categorize um, uh, in, in healthcare. And one of the, just one of them is nation states. Uh, the other is a criminal element looking for anything that they can monetize. Uh, we have uh, something called hacktivists, uh, people who are uh, uh, trying to either through social media or attempt to sway uh, pharma companies and others on what the pricing should be or other items that occur, as well as an insider threat. And with the vaccine uh, and development and therapeutics, what we've seen is we're now on a grander stage where people are, oh, wait a minute, there's, you know, there's a company that I should actually be looking at. Hey, what can I do there? And so we've seen that rise. Now, what we don't know, and, and I see you know, many different uh, attempts at assertion, malware is just code. It's just a binary that somebody's gonna try to put in my network. 
You're going to use uh, things like email and links and social media to get someone in my company to click on it and bring it into my house. Just muddy boots coming in the door. And so um, uh, in, the, <laughs> in the healthcare industry, we have the Health ISAC with Department of Homeland Security and working with uh, CISA. We work very close together so that we provide information. We found this code. And I don't have the resources to know where it came from or spend, you know, what are they actually going after? And working with um, our federal agencies, working with our government agencies and others, we provide that information, which then tells us, wait a minute, that's code that came from North Korea. And then, uh, then the warnings are going out. Now, most of the large pharma companies have the skills and cybersecurity organizations to be able to detect uh, this malicious type code and protect against it. And unfortunately, not everyone has that in the healthcare industry and working to get- Any indication that there's like a focus on trying to get something COVID related because everybody wants it right now? Is there an, a bigger appetite for it? Well, you know, there's only gonna be so many people who could get information and, and turn it into a vaccine. Um, then, you, then we're gonna have the group of people who just decide that, well, I don't want the world to have a vaccine. So though for us inside, it's really not much of a difference. That's so it. we have the protection capabilities that we've built. And then, you know, in, in this instance, looking at the vaccine production, and you can remember J&J uh, has a plant in Wuhan, China. We were able to see what was happening all along. We saw um, with the virus about a 30% uptick in what I will call hacktivists or criminal type activity, trying to monetize anything that they could. You know, I, I guess when people were out of work, they decided that there would be uh, hackers on the side um, and uh, try to come in and see what they could monetize. Right. Now, again, large companies, um, well-secured companies have the defenses against, the, against that and are able to defend um, uh, very easily. But again, in general, about a 30% uptick in activity wow. that was wow. specific. I'll be honest with you, most of it didn't, was it going for virus or it would be hard to tell because people will try to come in on one side to laterally move across your company. Sure. And it was the ability to detect it um, is what helped us. Now, much like Meredith, we took a concerted effort, anyone who was working on vaccine production, anybody who was going to be uh, working on the intellectual property, uh, what, uh, what were all those systems to lock them down, provide minimum necessary access? Those are just terms that we use in the security industry to say protect it. And um, uh, then we did that. And once, uh, as Meredith talked about the social media, about June timeframe, we saw one of the other companies really have some issues with social media, which we talked about at the HISAC board meeting. And uh, one of the things that happened was, is when we put that out, um, we, all we had all started to see some of that. So we informed our people to be aware of it. If, you know, shut off your social media, don't, uh, don't go in and click on anything in LinkedIn uh, and gave some people some guidelines to make sure they were secure. And do you have a little cybersecurity moat around uh, COVID stuff or is it sort of everything? No, I think that's the first time moat, moat and we got, cyber. We got a huge honk and moat, Dina. <laughs> that, that's what we do. Okay. I, Can I just ask? do in this world we create moats um, <laughs> you know a moat sounds like we close ourselves off so oh, in no, reality what what reality is is we provide the ability for the business to operate in an insecure environment giving the right controls and the right risk gotcha okay right? add one thing That's to perfect. this. I think Maureen, yeah. that was excellent in terms of the um, examples that you showed. But one of the things that we also found on our end 
was that our third parties that we partner with in order for us to carry out the mission here at Lilly, we did see an increase in terms of those third parties being um, impacted or attacked or um, victims of ransomware and things of that nature. So of course, when our third parties who are really close in the development research um, arm of, of the work that we do, when they start to get attacked, it becomes a problem for Lilly. And we now have to spring into action to assist those third parties um, to ensure that our value chain is protected and that we're continuously being able to deliver those life-saving medicines. So we did see an increase in that. Um, probably this year, we've, we've done way more um, incidents around our third parties than I've seen in the last couple of years. Right. And the really big hacks that we know about, they generally are coming in through some other vector like an HVAC system or something right. like that. That's why I asked you about routers. So Tonya, I, I don't forget that you're here. I know you're there somewhere out there in the ether. <laughs> I wanted to bring you in and um, uh, nice to see you. And I wanted to bring you in and talk a little bit about the components, the security components of Operation Warp Speed. Um, and Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson are, are among the players in that. And I think we don't know very much about the cybersecurity side of Warp Speed, what it looks like, maybe just because geeky people ask those questions and we're among geeks, so we're asking those questions now. Can you give us an idea of how that actually works in practice? Sure, well, I can speak a little bit to, I think the unique role that the FBI plays as part of that, but as you alluded to, there's a lot of different players, both across the federal government and with industry and the healthcare sector as well. And that's really what has made it so strong. I think from the FBI's perspective, we have the advantage um, and the unique role of being both a domestic law enforcement and intelligence agency. So that what that helps us to do in service of this mission of protecting the vaccine research and supporting the protection of the supply chain from these threats is to use our role having access to classified intelligence to understand what adversary plans and intentions are. So see the threats as they're forming. Um, to use our broad domestic presence with our 56 field offices, hundreds of other satellite agencies, where we're really embedded in communities and we have these enduring partnerships uh, with research institutions, companies, universities, et cetera, where we can have that information downgraded, uh, which effectively means uh, at a level that we can share it, um, ideally before something occurs. And then as an operational agency, we can actually act on what we see. And that's where the type of direct engagement uh, with these organizations is so important. Um, just like Maureen described, when one organization, like a university or a company, sees this type of threatening cyber activity, that we can use not only to investigate it, but also to share that information with the intelligence community, with network defenders, share it across and help everyone strengthen their networks. So it's really most effective when it's operating at all those different levels. Right, and are you getting, uh, in this current environment, are you getting more back and forth than you were in the past? Because I think that there were some times when companies were a little more reticent to let DHS or FBI know that they may have been compromised. We've certainly been extremely proactive in our outreach and that's been a combined effort. And that's really been a maturation, I think in the federal government, uh, especially over the past few years. Um, some of that was in response to uh, well-deserved feedback that we would receive from the private sector, not really appreciating having multiple federal agencies knocking at their door or sharing the same types of threat information with them. Increasingly, that's a partnership and that's really been exemplified by warp speed and even months before warp speed started. I mean, as early as March, when we were starting to see the indications, not only of cyber criminals, but also of nation states uh, targeting COVID research, we very quickly formed up with both CISA and the Department of Health and Human Services on a couple different fronts. One, to warn uh, those who were being directly targeted and then two, to do some reach research and expand that circle out to see, okay, if we know that these types of entities are being targeted, who's likely next? And try to get out and warn and get ahead of that threat. And then thirdly, we did something really kind of unusual for us in May, which is that with CISA, we issued a public service announcement, uh, particularly about the Chinese uh, cyber actors targeting COVID research. 
and that was for two main purposes. One, to warn, uh, but two, to also alert China that we had visibility and an understanding of what they were doing and to let them know there would be some risk and consequences to them for that type of activity. I think by virtue of that kind of sustained engagement, uh, we are seeing a, a great collaboration back with uh, the healthcare sector, even on issues that aren't specifically related to COVID research. For example, uh, the recent credible threat that we warned of with ransomware against hospitals and other healthcare providers. We got tremendous feedback from the healthcare sector, uh, organizations like the American Hospital Association uh, in response to that, because again, with CISA and HHS, we very quickly put out those indicators to watch for. We had um, kind of video calls and, and ways of engaging directly uh, with CISOs who might be affected to let them know that we were taking this seriously and um, that as a result, we were advising that they do too. And then keeping up that contact because we know that's a real resource drain when we're advising of a threat like that. And it requires a shift in resources and that's only sustainable for so long. So then that continued communication is important um, so that we can keep them updated on what we're seeing. And, and you know, one of the, the strategies that's been used in the past by DOJ and FBI is to actually bring charges against people. I'm thinking of the PLA uh, hackers that were brought charges against. Did the PSA, and, and that seemed to have an effect, right? However long it did, it had some uh, knock-on effect. Did the PSA putting out a public service announcement, did that have a knock-on effect? So we're aiming at a number of different audiences when we do things like that. And there's many different tools that are being used, not only by the FBI, but across the federal government and with some private sector partners, too, when we're doing efforts like that. Um, so there's the PSA, but that all that was also followed by an indictment uh, shortly thereafter that did uh, identify some Chinese cyber actors responsible for targeting COVID research. But increasingly, um, this is part of our new FBI cyber strategy that Director Ray just announced a few months ago. Um, it's not so much about an indictment, that's one means to an end, but because of the unique role in authorities and partnerships that I described that FBI has, we wanna make sure that we're sharing the information and relationships we have with our partners in the federal government, overseas, in the private sector, to do whatever steps we can, whether that's an FBI action, treasury sanctions, publicly outing, some more covert action that you might not see, and to do that in a joint, sequenced, coordinated way to have the maximum impact. Uh, because for too long, we think these adversaries have acted with what they think is impunity, and we want to change that risk calculus for them. Got it. So let me let me talk a little bit about intellectual property and how I how difficult it is, I think, to be a healthcare company. Um, trying to do open and cooperative research and the need to protect IP against hackers. Meredith, what are you guys doing in that respect? Well, when it comes to that, one of the things is making sure that we know where all of our IP sits. So I think that we have vast networks and um, we have uh, vast areas where we could store and house that information. And so there's protections that we've wrapped around those repositories where that intellectual property sits. Um, as it relates to the research though, as we're dealing with collabor collaborations that we may have with external research organizations as well as internal to our organization, we are also ensuring that we are helping to assess the security posture of those organizations as well, because again, they are participating and collaborating with us as it relates to that um, specific research, um, which is going to start to create IP from there. But we do have controls, um, not to get too deep into that, but we do have controls that are wrapped around those repositories um, to ensure uh, that we're monitoring um, on being able to detect any um, exposure to that data. Uh, we know how to monitor that on our end. All right, Maureen, do you have something to add to that? Um, no, just other than the uh, other tactics that we had talked about earlier is education of your workforce on what they're dealing with. You know, once you've been handling something for some period of time, you you lose sight sometimes of the importance. Um, at J&J, &J, we have our credos, so we continually talk about 
in the importance of the data to our patients and to our to healthcare and healthcare for humanity. Uh, we look at that. Uh, Meredith had hit on it really well about the third parties. No one company creates a vaccine or a drug by itself. There are multiple third parties, legal entities, patent filing, patent offices, um, as well as um, uh, your manufacturer and um, your distribution that you're going through. So you are continually looking at those third parties. The one thing on the road to the COVID vaccine did show my organization in a very, very quick period of time is look at the data flow. And so when you look at the data flow for intellectual property for something specific like a vaccine production, we learned a lot and are looking at uh, helping in the business in other ways that we wouldn't have known that existed if we hadn't done this during a short period of time. It also helped us, uh, we worked with the FBI and, and Special Agent Tammy uh, McHugh who, uh, out of the Newark office who came and talked to all our intellectual property attorneys, our regulatory attorneys to talk about the threat. And so that education um, and using our government uh, entities to be able to help us in this space was tremendous resources uh, for people to understand how important intellectual property is and how to protect it. So uh, an example of protection, I'm just guessing here is data at rest being encrypted. That, that's one, but I mean, it's everything from, and you talk about data at rest and people think about databases and big networks, but I need to look at the data on my computer. Is that, da you know, is that encrypted? Oh, I need to send it to Tanya. Is that then encrypted? What do you do? So there is a lot of elements of how things are and making sure you have the appropriate repositories and ability to steal pipe and encrypt that data from its beginning all the way till its end. Got it. Okay. So what I thought I'd do is save the news for last, which is very unjournalistic of me. And uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, I'll just uh, bring you quickly up to date that there was an article in the New York Times today that reports on cyber attacks on vaccine distribution operations, which uh, seamlessly goes to our next subject, what has to do with supply chain. So uh, IBM researchers and CISA both said that the attacks appeared to be intended to steal the network credentials of corporate executives and officials um, at global organizations. And to basically, these were officials who were very focused on cold chain, which is basically the refrigeration process necessary to protect some of these vaccines. Um, so uh, let me ask you th this question. In terms of fill and finish and supply chain, um, Meredith, what's the thing that worries you most about the vulnerabilities in distribution? I, th I think that sometimes there's not an awareness by those, those um, organizations that provide a critical part of our value chain and our development cycle. Um, they may not have the same level of uh, concern around security of their areas as say we may, because they think about it where I'm not really delivering IP, I'm offering code storage. Should I, should I really be that concerned about anything from a cyber perspective? I'm just housing something, right? So I, I think that that's my biggest concern is them being aware that they are targets um, when they are partnering with us and providing um, that service to us to be able to get the, the, the vaccines to where they need to be. So that would be my, my one biggest concern is this just not an awareness fully of uh, the fact that they are a target and, and in some instances may not have the same level of security controls that we have within our, our, our larger organization because they may be smaller organizations. They may not have that. And so that exposure is real. Well, and as a general matter, I would assume that if you have therapeutics or you have a regular flu vaccine, you haven't had to think quite so much about getting it from A to B and making sure it's safe. Correct. That, that because there's a, a, a finite amount of vaccine, mm -hmm. at least in this first tranche, that it's a hot commodity, a hotter commodity. 
Yes, yes. And I think when we think about the, the intent behind that, when we look at what the hackers um, and the bad guys are doing as it relates to that, I think it's, it's twofold. I think one is just pure disruption. I want to disrupt this, this flow or this cycle. Um, some may have a, a different uh, take on that where they may want to um, damage or expose those vaccines. So once they are delivered to a patient, they would not be, the efficacy is not um, um, there with what's being delivered to the patient. So I think you have multiple intents behind why uh, there's an interest in the whole cold chain or any other supportive um, 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 supply chain that we have for the development of our drugs. Maureen, are you teaching, uh, are, are you guys looking at this in a different way because it's COVID in terms uh, of this no, whole idea I of supply chain? No, uh, you know, uh, we have a robust supply chain and a business continuity plan around that. I, I will be, I am happy to say that J&J &J doesn't have the extreme temperature requirements uh, that some <laughs> right. of the other vaccines do. So um, for us, uh, it really, it, not that it's not a big deal, but what I would tell you, it's the overall security of getting the vaccine from point of manufacture into someone's arm. And having, um, I- Twice, form, in some cases. Unless it's a J&J &J vaccine, it's only one. <laughs> yeah, I was giving you a plug there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but what I told uh, one of my good friends uh, that were, that's a CISO at one of the companies that's going to all help in Operation Warp Speed to make sure that the vaccines are given out and is also in uh, pharmaceutical retail. What I told her was this is, um, because I had come from Medco, which was a pharmacy benefit um, company, and we did mail order delivery of drugs. Treat the vaccine like it's a C2 drug. All C2 drugs in the United States have a full, from the very beginning to when it's dispensed, have to have like a sign off. There's security requirements around it. There's alarm requirements if you're storing it. All of those things should be replicated for the vaccine. And I, I actually talked to the, um, the general in charge of the security for Operation Warp Speed. It's don't try to reinvent the wheel, use what you already have. It's a great practice. There's 50 boards of pharmacy across the United States that have all approved what you do for C2, just use it. Can and you explain what a C2 drug necessary. is? Hmm? Sorry, Maureen, for those of us who are not in the healthcare industry, could you explain what a C2 drug is? What an example of one would be? So a C2 two drug would be something like codeine or morphine, something that's highly addictive or highly controlled. It's, a, it's called a controlled substance. And so with those controlled substances, there's a whole chain of how they must be dispensed. And even, even organizations uh, like UPS or FedEx, when they have those types of a drug in their, um, their purview or their ownership to the delivered, they actually have protocols that are already set up. Right. And right. was that, and I, when you say the general in charge, you were talking to General Perna? No, no, no. He's in charge of everything. It was, uh, okay. I, I don't know if Mac wants me to give his name, but General okay. uh, McCurry. Okay. Okay. And, and so you didn't need to reinvent the wheel. There are systems in place. Maybe a C2 drug may not be as hot a commodity as a COVID, but there are building blocks there that you could, you could deal with. Right, that the pharmaceutical industry itself, you know, the requiring the extreme temperature or the sensitivity of how the drug must be dis, uh, dispensed is not something new. It doesn't, we, the protocols in healthcare are already there. Just utilize them, capitalize on them and modify them as necessary uh, for this instance. I don't, I don't have any visibility to what was done or was going on in that area, uh, but um, that was my recommendation. So, so does that mean that you feel pretty, I don't wanna go all the way to the word relaxed, but you don't well, have huge concerns with respect to the distribution of the vaccines? Um, no, no, I don't. I have full confidence in what the boards of pharmacy and the healthcare um, organizations in the United States have already created in leveraging what was already there. And I was in that industry for over 10 years and um, being able to ship 
and we had a, a large amount of C2 drugs in that other company that I worked with. A tractor trailer load of drugs went out every day from uh, the warehouse uh, to a distribution center. And all the protocols of you know, GPS, tracking, working with state police, monitoring, all of those things are already and have been in place. And utilizing those um, and leveraging them will make the job easier. Is there an opportunity to provide better communications, better visibility with today's digital technology? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, but, but it is, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence in the US healthcare system, what's already been put in place. So this idea, sorry to keep harping on this, but I think that the average person thinks that this whole distribution, all we've been hearing is how this distribution is gonna be the most enormous and complicated and bound to fail or bound to have problems. You don't think it's, it's, as, crazy, it's as complicated as people are saying that we've done this in sort of different levels in the past? Oh, don't, don't get me wrong that the distribution of controlled substances or substances that, that require a low temperature efficacy um, isn't complicated. It's extremely complicated. It's a problem the US healthcare industry um, has already solved okay. and can leverage those learnings uh, to be able to do, to make, to make this done in a secure manner. Will there be people, have there been people who have tried to steal C2 drugs in shipment before? Absolutely. Will there likely be some type of attempts? Maybe. But then the question is, what, what do you accomplish? Right, right. And, and thank you. And, and Tanya, let me get you in here as law enforcement. I mean, what are, what are you guys gearing up for when it comes in terms of uh, distribution of, of, of the vaccine? Well, from a cyber perspective, you know, our, there's obviously a number of motivations for some of these actors who are trying to disrupt the supply chain. Our, our biggest concern would be any sort of disruptive or destructive attack that would really try to, to throw a wrench uh, into that chain. And Meredith made a great point about the third parties. And, you know, we've certainly seen our cyber adversaries move to targeting of those third parties um, in order to try to then move into uh, the targets that they're trying to reach. Uh, but the, the motivations go beyond kind of that type of destructive or disruptive attack. It could be trying to steal the intellectual property for, um, for financial purposes. It could be uh, to undermine confidence in the US efforts to provide an effective vaccine or to advantage another country's uh, own development. Um, or it could be you know, a number of other purposes. But I think the other thing we try to keep in mind is that you know, while this discussion is focused on some of the, the cyber related threats, we see our most determined nation state adversaries not just relying on one method to target the supply chain, but to combine cyber with um, using kind of more traditional espionage and human sources to try to penetrate organizations and even through diplomatic means uh, to try to um, make entreaties and create relationships that might put them in a better position uh, to disrupt or influence or steal information. So it's really our focus is looking across all of those um, combining the efforts of our cyber and counterintelligence programs uh, to make sure we're looking across rather than uh, just at one type of attack vector. Right. Is there something in particular that worries you about this next phase of the vaccine? I think the complexity of it potentially, but honestly, hearing from Meredith and Maureen and the way that um, they're thinking about it, I mean, as was said, I mean, this is work that that they do all the time. They have the full support, obviously, of additional entities from the federal government who are, you know, so focused on protecting this research. Um, so that gives me confidence. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I tried to uh, slip in some of the questions that I saw in the in the Q and A channel. I want to thank you three so much for. Um, Talking about this, I was quite concerned about the whole cyber aspect of this and the distribution aspect. And it's it's fascinating to know how you've thought this through and how they're building blocks there already. For those of you who are uh, 
going to stay for our next session. Please stay tuned. We're going to be right back uh, with uh, the next session about emerging, emerging technologies and tech with um, some fascinating people, some of my favorite people in this particular arena. And I thank you so much for uh, being with us today for this session. And um, stay safe and healthy. Thanks for being with us. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the fifth annual Aspen Cyber Summit. I'm Vivian Schiller, Executive Director of Aspen Digital. As a reminder, you can find the full summit agenda and bios of all our speakers at aspencybersummit.org. I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for making this week's summit possible and helping us convene such an important set of conversations. We would also like to acknowledge Blue Vector, SIGPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support. I am now pleased to introduce Stephanie Mehta, the Editor-in-Chief of Fast Company, who will be leading a discussion with three senior leaders of the US intelligence community about emerging technologies and driving innovation inside government. Stephanie, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Vivian, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, as Vivian said, my name is Stephanie Metha. I'm editor of Fast Company, and I'm so excited to be leading this conversation about driving innovation inside government. We have an amazing group of leaders who are going to help us talk about this subject. And, and as Vivian mentioned, you can read their full bios on the Aspen Cyber Summit site, but let me briefly go ahead and introduce them to you today. Um, we are joined by Dr. Stacy Dixon, she is the eighth deputy director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, where she helps lead the agency and manage the national system for geospatial intelligence. She's been in this role since June of 2019. And before that, she was director at the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency. Now, Dr. Dixon was succeeded at IARPA by our next panelist. Dr. Catherine Marsh is director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity and uh, Agency. And she, as head of IARPA, Dr. Marsh leads a multidisciplinary research program to help develop technologies for national intelligence missions. And prior to her role here, she served as the CIA's chief scientist in the Directorate of Science and Technology and she also served as the ds and primary science advisor. Our third panelist today is Anne Neuberger. She is the director of the Cybersecurity Directorate at the National Security Agency. Uh, Ms. Neuberger's directorate is uh, basically designed to help combat the evolving threat landscape. She's also in charge of capitalizing on the ability to set security standards and make vulnerability assessments and she's here to enhance partnerships with Cyber Command, Homeland Security, the FBI, and of course, private industry. And we're going to be talking a lot about partnerships and private industry as part of this discussion. Um, welcome to all of the panelists. Um, let me start by asking um, each of the panelists, and I think we'll just go alphabetically down the road, um, to talk a little bit about the technologies um, that excite you most, and the technologies or innovations that give you pause or scare you or that, that, that seem like threats. Let's start with Dr. Dixon. What excites you and what scares you? Thanks, Stephanie. It's interesting for me, there's overlap there. So from the geospatial perspective and in the line of work that we're in, I'm looking mainly at satellites and the amount of information that's out there from which we can derive intelligence. So the, there are over 90 different constellations of Earth observing satellites that we have are tracking the development of. And many of those are gonna provide a lot of information that we and the government are going to be able to use. Some will be owned by other countries, some will be uh, owned by other governments. That is a lot of data as to what's happening in our country, but more importantly for us, it's a lot of data information as to what's happening in other countries. So being able to use that leverage automation to help us to triage through it and to leverage that information is really uh, something that I'm really excited about. Uh, and we found even during this sort of COVID-19 time period, how much of this data has been really useful for our mission uh, as we're trying to work in a telework environment. And we will have a chance to talk about that a little bit later. 
Um, I'm also worried about it because it means that it's a lot harder to hide or protect the things that we need to be hiding and protecting. And uh, from an intelligence perspective, it will change the way that we do business in many ways. Um, so it's a balance of both of those things, but we need to understand it, number one. And so we in particular have created what we're calling geo-insurance, which helps us help others understand what's overhead, uh, what others can see that we may not want them to be seeing and how do you sort of best protect yourself. So uh, the, the uh, explosion of data, both satellite and others is sort of both the thing that I see an opportunity in as well as that sort of scares me at times. I will definitely want to come back to, to some of the challenges and remote work um, issues you, you referenced. Uh, Dr. Marsh, same question for you. What technologies excite you most and then what technologies or innovations um, make you nervous? Oh, we need you to unmute. Can you hear me? There we go. So it's fascinating. Uh, life is different. Anyhow, uh, so for me, I'm a battery geek, and I'm I am continue to be a battery geek. And so, being excited about what the new capabilities are, because that provides us enhanced range and uh, uh, the ability to do things that we couldn't do, right? Uh, you know, I've been involved with that, so that's always going to be an excitement area for me because I'm a geek. Um, but uh, you know, I'm also really excited about the advances that we see coming on in quantum and quantum computing and what that enables. So as, as Stacey mentioned about the large amounts of data, as we progress and push quantum computing and quantum capabilities, that's going to help with being able to process that enormous amount of data. Um, and, uh, you know, but from a, what scares the living daylights out of me is really uh, the bioterrorism kinds of uh, capabilities that are out there, the ability and easy access to um, uh, mutate genes, right, to genetically edit things, and then unintentionally or intentionally create some sort of um, a backlash as a consequence of that that could um, make things dangerous in the world. So I worry about that, and I worry about, um, you know, ubiquitous sensors and the enormous amount of data that's out there everywhere that is being collected about our people um, as they try to move around in this world. I think that those are the things that I'm, I really have to worry about. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and we'll, again, want to come back and, and talk about um, about all of those things. Um, Director Neuberger, uh, what scares you, uh, but more importantly, what excites you? I love the order of that question. You're right. What's more important is what excites. So the first thing above all is machine learning. It gives us the opportunity to perform analysis at a level of complexity deeper than humans can. For example, machine language enabled software reverse engineering with tools like Ghidra, which we open sourced recently. And it also enables us to make better, faster decisions. As Dr. Dixon talked about, we look at the broad scale of data that's available and actually sorting and prioritizing data, video, speech, image, and text analytics, and enabling us to make decisions faster, particularly in the national security community. You can come to conclusions faster. Um, from a cybersecurity perspective, identify more quickly, classify malware, really promising in terms of an opportunity. You know, a, a second area of opportunity that I'm really excited about is really what's happening in the space industry, where on the technology side, we see much more highly integrated systems, hosted payloads, so we can take advantage in the national security world of commercial technologies, certainly larger constellations and explosion of space companies. On the flip side of that, you know, our mission here, one of our missions is we build a cryptography that protects the nation's most sensitive systems across the national security missions. And as such, to in order to take advantage of, I'll talk specifically about the second item, about the space industry, we know we need to come up with different approaches to, for example, allow us to do crypto at low size, weight, and power, allow us to provide crypto for proliferated constellations. So with those opportunities both comes creative things we need to approach um, and do as well as potential risks of how we defend against adversaries using those same kind of interesting technologies um, for harm. You know, in just five minutes, we've covered a dizzying array of topics. We've covered bio threats and biotechnology. We've covered space. We've covered uh, satellites. I I'd love to hear from each of you how you stay on top of all of these sort of cutting edge uh, 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 
evolutions and developments. I, I understand it's your job, but I just love to hear a little bit more about how you ensure that you are staying on top of all of the innovation and developments that are, are coming out of your own labs, as well as what we're seeing more broadly in the technology community. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll go the other way. I'll start with, uh, with, with Anne and then uh, work our way to, to, to Dr. Marsh and, and Dr. Dixon. Absolutely. So first, I think one of the things each of our organizations takes great pride in is building technical depth, recruiting people in diverse technical areas, and ensuring that we give them a way to continue to develop their skills, as well as maintain partnerships with the academic sector across the national security community, as well as with the broader private sector R&D labs, in order to understand different technologies, understand their mission application, and understand their level of maturity. So first and above all, it takes team and building that team and understanding in each of our organizations, what our deep comparative advantages. At NSA, for example, cryptography is a big area of focus. We make codes, we break codes. So areas like quantum resistant cryptography that was mentioned earlier has been a big area of focus for us. Um, because we know we play a key role in, in those technologies. Areas like machine learning, because we know we have large amounts of data and we need to quickly make sense of it and enable others to make decisions off of that. And then certainly areas like telecommunication standards and areas 5G, 6G. So for us, and for us both as an organization personally, it's first ensuring you've built the internal team in areas that you know is your deep bench, is an area that people and organizations look to you to maintain expertise, and then building the broad set of partnerships so that you have both positive indications and negative warnings about technologies that you need to be aware of in terms of impact to the national security mission. Dr. Marsh, same question for you. Um, you know, how do you stay abreast of, of everything that's happening in the world? Uh, so, uh, you can't stay abreast of everything, but I, I second exactly what Anne says, is you, um, you can't know everything, but you can surround yourself with really smart people. And we do that. We network, we rely on our network, um, no program uh, in here. Uh, we always have our partners across the IC at all of our program reviews, at all of the work that we're doing from our new start pitch all the way through to um, help with the catch, if you will, of the technology at the end of the day. And so relying on our government partners and our experts across the nation who are that true expert. I mean, if you wanted to know battery stuff, you'd come and you'd talk to me, right? But but uh, if you want quantum computing, you're going to go talk to that like that, right? So it's making sure you know who those folks are that you can tap into, and and uh, and get the rudder steered correctly for you, and uh, ensure all along the way that we're we're doing it. And and the other thing that Anne said that is spot on: hiring the best and brightest minds, right? Bringing them to bear on our problems is what works. And so how do you do that? And how do you do that in an agile and appropriate manner? Because um, getting hired into the IC is an arduous process. Um, and so doing that and then allowing them to stay what I used to praise um, and still do, technically sharp, making sure that you give them the bandwidth to keep their skills current. And how they're going to apply them is going to be different. But taking those, that advantage for them, you need to have a constant influx. And at IARPA, all of our folks are term limited appointments. So they come in with um, a passion, an idea they're passionate about. They're there for three to five years. They run that program or multiple programs in their area of expertise, and then they go, go on from there. So that allows for that constant influx of new ideas and new capabilities. And I'm not taking somebody who might be an expert in crypto and trying to make them do something in battery technology, because that just doesn't, it doesn't work as effectively. Dr. Dixon, what are some of the, the, the tools you use and have at your disposal to make sure that you're staying on top of, of these trends? Yeah, I'll have to, I'll, I'll just 
echo what both Catherine and Anne said. Um, it, it is really is about the people and making sure that you're hiring the best. Uh, you know, from this seat, I don't really have the opportunity to sit in on as many of the technical discussions as you know my heart and my brain would like. So I, I have to leverage those those uh, those exposure opportunities where people mention a topic or you know research will mention a subject or we'll have a briefing at a, an operational meeting and. I'll ask for a follow-up and I'll do a desk side where I can go and actually watch the analysts or I'll have them come and give me more details. And just knowing that you've got great people out there and who are more than happy to kind of bring you up to speed. From a, a um, well, the other nice, nice thing is, you know, we're, none of us are limited to just our agency. There are four out there where we can uh, learn about what the other agencies are doing. There are um, uh, weekly reports that go out that kind of highlight some of the really cool capabilities. And it's easy enough to kind of hear about what some other agency is doing and then to go ask for information from them as well. Uh, that's always nice. And then sort of personally, my news feed has all sorts of uh, science publications and I, you know, for, to, the, to the science journalists out there, you know, love what you guys do in terms of keeping up, helping us, everyone keep up with the really neat capabilities and developments happening in science all across the world, because that's sort of how I feed myself on sort of the, the outside work time. And, you know, there's always something new uh, coming through and, and the linkages between what I'm seeing on the, you know, on my newsfeed and even what we're trying to do internally in the intelligence community. Like there are bridges that we can make there and there are partnerships that, that we can find by looking at it that way as well. Yeah. Dr. Marsh, you talked so passionately about the talent and bringing the right caliber of talent into your organization. I'll start with you, but I definitely want to hear from the other panelists. What is the what is the key to attracting the best and brightest to an organization like yours, particularly when for a new generation of young people coming into science and technology careers, um, government may not necessarily be the first place they think of when it comes to innovation. Indeed, government's probably not. Um, uh, it, it just, we are out there actively recruiting all the time. And so getting people to understand our problems, whether they be uh, someone who happens to be inside the government already, or someone who is very, very interested in our capabilities. Um, we have a number of uh, true areas where we have thrived over time, you know, facial recognition is one, uh, machine translation is another, um, quantum computing is a third. And so getting those going and intentionally looking for that next great program manager, working with them intentionally to develop a new start pitch. And if it's in their sweet spot, in their area of expertise, it just happens naturally. They come on board, they want to do this. And so they thrive. And that's, that's key. Um, and having a good idea and being passionate about it is, is necessary. And you still have to have some uh, other skills. You've got to be able to be organized, to be self-starter, to uh, drive to completion. You're given, we give people a lot of rain at IARPA to do what they do and do it really, really well. We uh, give them the funding that it takes to make a difference in their technology area and so we expect them to do that and we guide them, but we don't micromanage them. And I think that that, that is a winning formula to ensure the, um, the, the success of the programs or the opportunity to take really high risk um, bets, right? Because we do high risk, high payoff. And that means some of it fails. We, have, we know that that's gonna happen and we have to engage to allow that to happen because if we're doing everything as a sure bet, then we're not taking enough risk. And in the ARP, ARPA models, right, DARPA, IARPA, ARPA-E, we shouldn't be doing that. Some, some fraction of our programs are going to fail. Hopefully we can recover some aspect of it or transition some aspect of it, but we've learned as a consequence of that, we've documented, and so that alone is a lesson learned so that we can share with the community. Second? Yeah, absolutely. And you unmuted. It sounds like you have uh, you wanted to, to chime in. Ah, no, I just, I, uh, I, I'll share thoughts. Thank you for that. You know, it's interesting. You asked the question about attraction. And I think if we define attraction as attracting and attracting each day for that first one to stay. And I think it's a couple of things. But one thing is giving people problems 
that make them feel they're part of something larger than themselves, that are really fulfilling, where they can bring their skill set to something that they feel they're making a difference. And a part of that is certainly the problems, but also having an, a culture of innovation where people feel that the ideas they have can be applied and can take hold. And I think the second thing, certainly to the point made earlier, um, it's sometimes hard to make your way all the way through to the IC, and we had concepts of this you know, multi-decade IC career, at least here at, at NSA. So I think for us, being open to individuals who may come in, serve for a few years, go out, continue their career in academia, the private sector, or folks who come in mid-career, being open to more diverse careers and people with more diverse backgrounds um, is a big part of that too. In cybersecurity, specifically, one of the things that I find exciting is there are so many ways for people to get hands-on keyboard, practical, on-the-job experiences and knowledge that some of the traditional paths of college, master's, PhD programs are important, but they don't need to be exclusive. So we can open to a much more diverse community who can contribute to our cybersecurity mission um, than we may be able to do in other areas, which is particularly exciting. A lot of what you both have described sound not unlike the innovation opportunity inside the private sector. Uh, Dr. Dixon, what are the things that private sector folks need to kind of unlearn or what are the skills or traits they have to develop to be successful inside IC if they've come from private sector or if they've cycled in from, from a different kind of industry? Okay, so I promised to answer your question, but I just wanna tag on a small piece for that last one. I'm really proud of the internship program that we've developed because we find that it's one of those great ways to get a lot of you know, new innovative thinking, a lot of the new skill sets that are out there. And you know, we're having actually, we're able to not only bring in a more diverse part of our workforce by focusing on universities and getting, getting the students excited about us, but we find that you know, once you give them very meaningful projects to work on, they will come back year after year. And then our conversion rate to full-time employment I was hovering at about the 70% mark with the intern. So it's a great way to kind of test out government uh, to see if it's something that might be for you. With respect to people coming in from the outside, I think part of it is, is not making the assumption that automatically your ideas are the best ideas. You know, I think uh, Catherine, Catherine mentioned, mentioned it. it. You mentioned it, you have, a, um, have an, an a, assumption a, that, that was an echo. <laughs> You, you, uh, you think that you know what happens in the IC. You think you know what the capabilities are, and then you come in and things are a little bit different. So I would say give give some level of time to actually understand and, and learn about the environment and best how to work through the environment. Yes, government tends to be more bureaucratic in many ways than industry. However, once you figure out how things work, you know you can bring your new ideas in. Um, and you'll find that there are a lot of innovative people and capabilities inside as well. And it's a matter of sort of merging the two, bringing your experiences from the outside in and then figuring out how to uh, interact and, and, and collaborate within the government to kind of get your ideas moved forward. It's probably the place that I've seen people struggle the most where they assume that they're bringing something in that no one else has ever heard of. And that's not usually the case. Uh, it may be a different application or uh, it may be a different way of thinking about it but they need to learn how to get their idea heard and um, uh, how to get it transitioned into the operations within the government. I, I'd love to ask each of you a little bit about how you as leaders are able to help foster a culture of innovation. Um, you know, th there are obviously some constraints because of the part of the Department of Defense in which you work and because of the somewhat secretive nature of, of some of what you do. Um, and of course, because of the rigors of, of the work, but you're all also leaders and have the opportunity to help set the tone for the organization. And um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about things that you've brought uniquely to the role or changes you've been able to execute that you think have helped really drive a culture of innovation, which is sort of the theme of, of this talk. Um, Let's, uh, let's start with Dr. Dixon since, uh, since we just left off with you. I think the thing that has been the most exciting to me and, and part of it has been, I would say accelerated or even inspired during this pandemic time is giving people the opportunity to come up with solutions, pushing authority down to a level where you don't have to have people ask for permission at many levels before they can get something done. COVID put us all in a place where we needed to figure out how to operate in a world in which most of our, our employees were outside of the building and not inside the building very quickly and still wanted to get a lot of meaningful work done. 
And so we gave people a challenge, see what you can find out there in publicly available and uh, commercially available data that can contribute to your mission. We've been astounded at the types of products and analysis that we've been able to do that has either been standalone products or products that we could then bring in and then uh, uh, enhance with classified information. So challenging people and allowing them to be creative, allowing them, especially during this time period, to, you know, this might, might not have worked the way, the way that it did. Failure was okay. Catherine mentioned failure as well. You have to be able and open to that. Um, and so those are the things, just making sure that we're, we're, we're allowing people to know that their innovation, their proactivity, their, I'm going to go learn something new so I can figure out how to apply it to work is welcome. And that's the kind of environment we want. We want people who are willing to go learn new things and then figure out how to make them work within the mission uh, that we've given them. Dr. Marsh, what are some of the things that you've done at IARPA to help drive a culture of innovation and maybe changes that you've made or, or tweaks to, to this to, to process that have really helped stoke a new new kind of culture? Okay, so um, I, I can't I can't agree more than what uh, than, than what Stacy just said. So first of all, our assets go home at night. Our people are our assets, right? All the other stuff doesn't matter. And you know, allowing them and empowering them, you know, they, they've got these great ideas that they are working on that, that's theirs, right? And trusting your people. You've got to trust your people. You don't need to see them to trust them. And um, that's a huge shift for the intelligence community, right? I mean, I had only been there a few months when I sent everybody home to work from home. And thank goodness for uh, Stacy, my predecessor, getting the IQ environment up and running because it, it enabled that for, for us. And they didn't miss a beat. So people are creative. You reward that. Um, you, I'm, I'm a strong believer in complimenting people in private and uh, 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 in, in public and, and scolding in private. I, I really uh, have kind of made sure that people know that they matter and uh, give them that feedback regularly, even in this very um, distanced way um, and regularly keep the lines of communication open. You can't over communicate and just, you forget, you know, because I've been in the building the entire time, you forget that people don't stay connected in the same way when you can't just drop, drop in on one another. So it's finding new ways and creative ways, as Stacy said, to um, let them bring solutions forward. And I'm a huge believer in teaching curiosity and enabling curiosity. If people have to want to know why, who, how, and, and making, no, making known that it, it's okay to ask those questions. And some of the things that I've learned and since I've been here is when I have asked those questions and people know that I ask a lot of questions is, well, we've always done it that way. Well, but why are we doing it that way? That's not a good answer for me. And so in questioning and, and creating that culture where I question and then other people question, we've been able to streamline a number of different processes in our acquisitions pipeline and things like that, because we have just always done it that way and we don't have to. Um, and, you know, it, fresh eyes help with that, but it's also that, that by me leading by example with asking the questions and knowing that that's okay, others follow. I think that helps. And what are some of the things that you've tried to do um, in your role as a leader, leader to, to change, the, change dynamic the dynamic or, or enhance, enhance the, the, the innovation, innovation culture, culture at, the, at, at NSA? NSA. Yeah, so one of the things I've observed in, in looking over the years at innovations that were successful and taking seed and then scaling and those that weren't is that real innovation takes alignment across the organization, the mission, the problem you're seeking to solve. Often the technical specialists may come up with an approach and then the policy and legal community who may say, well, we can't quite do that. Or So part for me of, of getting innovations and creating that culture is to say, every org is part of our innovation. We don't have one innovation org only in the technical area or only in our counterterrorism or 
in order for us to successfully scale, we need folks who have come from all those communities working together on one team. And, and then the team is rewarded as a team. So our attorneys, our policy, uh, individuals who document new policies get the same award because they've been a part of making that success happen. So that's that first piece because sometimes we can end up with kind of cultural silos that operate at a different pace, have a different understanding of the problem and have a different sense of urgency about solving it. And we know that we need that aligned in that way. And for us in the cybersecurity organization, we had a really unique place because partially our goal was to say, our key goal was to say, let's ensure that we combine our threat intelligence about the latest techniques and tactics adversaries are using to break systems with practical advice on how to counter it, right? The threat intelligence issued at a top secret level is interesting. It's so much more powerful if it's at the unclassified level combined with real technical advice, software, hardware, techniques, PPPs, on how you protect against it. And to get to that really takes that alignment of our intelligence group folks, our vulnerability analyst folks, and certainly our attorneys and policymakers to say, how do we do that internally? So it's a, that's been for me at least, trying to build one culture across those communities. There have been some questions question in, the chat, in the chat, and also and I'm curious to hear from all of you about the relationship between each of your organizations and the private sector um, and the opportunities and the there, for there for partnership, partnership. but also um, ways where they might inspire innovations or innovation culture. Um, Dr. Marsh, I know um, you know a lot of what you do is is highly classified, and so it's it's hard to to necessarily have the same kind of relationship with the private sector. But um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the work that you may do with external parties like laboratories and universities, and and how that uh, contributes to innovation at IARPA? So actually, one of the things that's great about IARPA is to the maximum extent possible, we do full and open competition. And so we have active, active on the street uh, tomorrow, we're going to be releasing a new BAA um, uh, for, for a program, the Briar program it should hit the street tomorrow. And um, we have two that just closed. So we're out there very, very publicly. We are the public face of, of the DNI. And we engage both with private sectors um, to, to, and we really want new ideas from all over the world to contribute to our programs. So we don't want to just narrowly focus on, um, you know, folks who have to be domestic. So we want small companies, we want big companies, we have international best minds in the world to bring to bear on our problems. It's more our partners in the, cost, in the transition end where things become classified and how we might use that technology after the fact. Um, so we're really out there uh, with, with everybody. In fact, I can't say the exact number, but we put a, a COVID BAA on the street earlier this year and received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of proposals um, that we're uh, working our way through and making decisions on for awarding contracts. And some of those players are, are not people who have ever participated uh, with IARPA before. So, it's, it's goodness and to be able to use that mechanism. The other thing, um, uh, we partner with the national labs, FFRDCs and the UARCs to be our t &E partners. So, um, as well as government laboratories where there's technical expertise and testing capabilities like NIST, for example. So we, we do both sectors, t &E one way and um, participation, participation in our programs another way. And have you seen those those relationships change or evolve over the years, uh, particularly those with the the labs and the private industry? Is is there? Are you working more closely together? Has the nature of the relationship changed over time? So yes and no. Um, uh, so sometimes there's some bad behavior that comes up over time, and so you have to kind of put horse back in the barn and take care of those things. But uh, for the most part, um, what we see is more and more opportunities. Um, Pre-COVID, we were out there um, regularly engaging with universities, getting them interested in our programs so that we could get more participants. Um, we're doing that virtually now. We're actively looking at and using um, Amy, um, which is uh, to 
uh, bring more diversity to our profile. And we are trying to engage with, not trying, we are engaging with them uh, for the postdoc participation this year to make sure that we can get uh, more, even more schools engaged with the s &T aspects of innovation, not just for IARPA programs, but for intelligence community problems writ large. You know, one thing I hear from um, vendors, third parties, uh, startups all the time is, you know, they do complain that government agencies are hard to work with. Um, Dr. Dixon, are there things that you are able to do at your uh, agency to make it easier for third parties, external folks to, to come together with you and, and innovate? I think one of the things you'll see in government a lot, and one of the things that IARP in particular does did does great a great way of, does does really well, um, focusing on price challenges, and then the the broad agency announcements that Catherine mentioned. They are uh, contracting methods that are more flexible, more streamlined, uh, can be a lot faster than sort of a traditional, I'm going to tell you exactly what I need and then you're gonna to propose to it. So those are things that NGA is uh, undertaking a lot more. And actually during this COVID time period, we had three or four prize challenges. We just put out a competition um, using other transactional authority. So another tool in our acquisition toolbox. So we're getting very creative in finding ways to be quicker because we have definitely heard that feedback that it can be a long time for us to get things on contract. So how do we more quickly move, especially when technology moves so quickly? How do you get new ideas, new players, people who've never worked with government because of the fact that they thought it was too cumbersome to be interested in not only the challenges you have to solve, but in actually working with you. And price challenges and broad agency announcements have been great tools to use. Uh, you know, the, the intelligence community and the Department of Defense more broadly have brought so many innovations and technologies to mainstream society. We have all benefited so much from the work that, that different agencies have done and everything from GPS to certain vaccines all have come out of, of, of government agencies. I, I'd love to ask all of the panelists to talk a little bit about what you need from either taxpayers or lawmakers or other parts of the ecosystem in order to keep doing the innovation work you're doing. And I'll start with Anne. Um, a few people in the, the chat have mentioned that you're a little bit hard to hear. I don't know if you can maybe move a little closer to your microphone. Sure, absolutely. But uh, I'm actually laughing at that comment about an NSA or who's hard to hear. Folks typically laugh at that we're good at listening. And uh, so that's just, um, I think a first part is, as many of us talk through, what helps us, what is the root of our success in innovation and in technology breakthroughs is people. So people coming in, giving us a chance. You know, it's uh, understanding that in the intelligence community, the Department of Defense community, there are hard problems that we seek to solve. And sometimes those problems are solved in the shadows. So it's upon us to build greater trust in talking about our missions and talking about the cultures that we have here so that people want to come and, and, and work within those cultures. And, and then I think the second piece of that is uh, giving us flexible ways to hire individuals, bring in individuals, in some cases, help compete with private sector salaries. We know we need to compete and we can on the type of mission problems they'll work on solving, but sometimes it's really um, challenging for folks to take a step out of their lives and come and join. So I would say summing that up, recognizing first that what makes us who we are are the great technical people that we can attract and retain. And anything to help us incentivize that is great. And then it's upon all of us to ensure that the broader population has visibility into the kinds of problems we seek to solve so they want to join us and be a part of that. Dr. Dixon, same question for you. Um, what, can, what can the public do to help advance the mission of, of innovation at, uh, at your agency? Stephanie, I'll, I'll be a little uh, broad with this one. I, I need to see more trust from the American people um, uh, for government in general. Um, you know, the intelligence community, I know that we have a lot of secrets, but we really go out of our way to be transparent, to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And I think what people don't seem to understand is there is uh, the democratic way of life for American values. It's not guaranteed. There are countries out there who want to be better than us. They want their country to raise in stature while ours decreases. 
And if we don't have more partnerships with the American people, whether that's with academia and industry and those who want to help support government, help government be successful so that we can help keep the country safe, um, we're really jeopardizing our future. So I want trust. I want, I want faith in our government. I want faith in the things that we're trying to do and an understanding that, you know, at the end of the day, I want to keep this country safe. Um, I want to keep this country prosperous and I want to make sure that our values are values that we can define and, and determine. So anything that the public can do to help that is, is what I'm asking. Dr. Marsh, any thoughts on, on how we can help IARPA succeed? Actually, just continue to participate and to, you know, we have the opportunity to uh, bring all these minds to bear and we want you to continue to give us your ideas. We are really blessed because we don't, like Stacy said, we don't go out with a, I want to buy this widget that's this tall and whatever. We go out with a problem and we're looking for your great ideas to bring them to bear on this. And so how do you continue to do that? And, and I, I agree with what Stacy said also in the, how do you use grants, transactions, other authorities so that we are agile with our um, acquisition uh, authorities to get people under contract quickly? You know, I'm, I'm pushing my program managers. It's not acceptable to me that you go through source selection and, you know, it's six months later before I see, um, you know, the down select memo. Absolutely not. I, I'm like, if I don't see it in X period of time, we're going to have a conversation here. So I, I respect that it takes time for people who are out there and they bid on this work. We want to be um, respectful of them and get them an answer as soon as we can. Um, that's what's going to keep them coming back, right? Uh, so being, being smart about that. And respect, that. They've got great ideas. Yeah. I, I love hearing the sense of urgency from all three of you. Um, in our time remaining, Dr. Dixon, you did raise the specter of America's place in the world. I, I'd love to hear each of the panelists talk about American competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis technology and perhaps vis-a-vis -vis intelligence technology. Um, do, do you feel like America continues to, 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 to play a leading role or should we be concerned about um, the fact that so many other countries and China in particular, um, you know, are playing catch up or taking the lead in some cases in areas like artificial intelligence and, and certainly doing a lot of experimentation in quantum. Um, and I'll start with you. How do you feel about where American technology sits in the world? So I think the, the model of American technology of pressing on or aiming for open standards of aiming for open innovation is certainly one that it's been at the root of American competitiveness. It's what attracted immigrants from all over the world. It's what enabled US companies to be some of the leading and largest in a number of different areas. When we look at certain more state-driven models like the Chinese model, we're certainly seeing it making focused advancements in areas of new R&D. And I think as a result, both across the intelligence community and the research community, we've put focus areas on those same things to ensure that we can remain competitive. One area where there is a bit of a divergence in approach where we are looking to see how do we ensure the American model can be competitive is in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning that's fundamentally built on large amounts of data, large amounts of data that can be brought together for insights. In the American model, much of, those, much of that data is across the private sector. So in many cases, many of those models and that insight in order for that broader competitiveness to be advanced, and in order for us as an economy and as a country to get the full benefit of that, we need to ensure that we have both sharing of those models and ability to talk through them and ability to understand um, how, to, um, how to ensure that they're used most broadly to solve broad sets of mission problems, not unique to who owns the data specifically. And I think that's one area where Certainly, as we look to the future, a Western model, both from protecting privacy, but also making the most of data so that the insights and models are fully leveraged is something that is a challenge we have to think through. Uh, Dr. Dixon, uh, American competitiveness when it comes to technology and particularly perhaps some of the, the technologies that you mentioned at the top of the conversation as being things that you're 
you're particularly excited about in the area of satellites and, and data? Uh, so the, the thing that sort of worries me is sort of maintaining the advantage that we've had for so long. And if you look at the, you know, our sort of our placement in the global co competition for students, um, American scores in math and science, you know, where our student body is, how well are we preparing individuals in the intelligence community, we're hiring American citizens for the most part for government jobs. And yet universities are graduating a lot more foreign students in some of these high tech areas. So we, we need to commit to more uh, focus on science and technology, just with the American students and citizens, citizens in general. Uh, with respect to the technologies, the, the nice thing is the government doesn't have to lead in everything, right? We pick the areas where we need to lead. There's some that we want to influence or tailor for intelligence challenges. And then there's some where we just need to be able to adopt it more quickly. So picking, picking those battles, picking the places where we really need to prioritize our leadership and then really focusing those and resourcing those long, you know, long term uh, is where we need to uh, sort of partner government, government, executive branch, government, legislative, legislative branch to be able to then have the support we need to be able to really focus on those long term initiatives. So I'm excited by the industry that we've seen. I'm excited that we can leverage both foreign and commercial industry in the US. But in those places where we need to lead, we really need to more, have more focus on uh, getting more American students to focus on math and science. And, and I hope people are getting excited about that and that we can inspire some folks to choose that path. Dr. Marsh, I'm going to give you the last word. Okay, so, you know, I cannot agree with what Stacy said more. In fact, my, in thinking about this, we can't start in, in college. We've got to start in grade school. We've got to get people excited in grade school. We've got to get our math and science teachers, the teachers at the elementary level to be excited about uh, the STEM fields uh, and all across, right? Because if we capture the minds, the hearts and minds of the children, then, and teach them to be curious, right? Teach them to ask the who, what, when, where, why, how questions. Okay, then they're gonna follow their path and dreams into the, um, the world of science, whether it be for the government or, or the private sector, but we will have that further investment. So I think that as a, you know, if we want help from the taxpayers, it's getting the primary up middle school and high school education to have much more of an emphasis on science. I mean, my, my niece went to high school, graduated from high school, she's a sophomore at UVA now, she went through chemistry without having a lab. How can that possibly be, right? And it, it's just not, it, you know, because there wasn't enough funding and that, that's that got to change. And I think fundamentally when we can do that, that, I mean, the reason I'm a scientist today is because I watched when we were, when I was eight years old, us land on the moon, right? And how could we possibly do that? Those are the things that are gonna get that investment in our future. Uh, to get us where we need to be. So sorry, I'm on my soapbox, but that is something that really matters to me. Yeah, well, I, I would say that all three of you are definitely um, individuals who can inspire a new generation of scientists and technologists. I wanna thank our panelists, Stacy Dixon, Catherine March, and Neuberger. Thank you so much for being with us for this conversation about innovation in the public sector. I wanna thank Aspen Institute and the Aspen Digital crew, and of course the Aspen Cyber Summit. Thank you all for listening today and have a great afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Garrett Graff. I'm the director of the Cyber Initiative at the Aspen Institute here uh, with Aspen Digital. And thanks so much for joining our summit today. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, be leading our next session. Um, the full summit agenda and bios of our speakers are available at aspencybersummit.org. Um, and I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for making this week's summit possible and helping uh, organize these conversations and let us talk with such a great and diverse set of speakers today, um, along with uh, acknowledging Blue Vector, SICPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support. 
I'm here uh, now uh, we, for the next 30 minutes with Brandon Wales, the acting director of CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, for what uh, I hope is going to be a fascinating conversation about the election, about the COVID pandemic, about the state of cybersecurity and infrastructure security and critical infrastructure across the, the country. Um, uh, Brandon, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Garrett, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I am uh, very happy to be here and talk about the important work that our agency is doing. So um, let me, today is December 3rd. Um, it, it is hard to believe that exactly a month ago on November 3rd, we were sitting down as a country to watch the first election results roll in. Uh, it feels like uh, we have as a country lived about uh, 25 years in the last month. And I would imagine for you sitting at CISA, it has actually felt somehow even longer uh, than that. Um, I, I wanted to start off today by uh, taking you actually back three weeks ago. Um, on Thursday after the election, uh, CISA put out a statement that I want to quote uh, three lines from. The November 3rd election was the most secure in American history. There is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. While we know that there are many unfounded claims and opportunities for misinformation about the process of our elections, we can assure you that we have the utmost confidence in the security and integrity of our elections, and you should too. And my question, Brandon, is, uh, you know, we have seen a lot of claims, a lot of arguments, a lot of court cases over the three weeks since that statement came out. Is there any reason in your mind, anything that you have seen, anything that you have read, anything that you have heard that would cause you to change that statement today? Garrett, so I think you know, the agency stands by the statement that was issued uh, at the beginning of November, but I do wanna add just a little bit of context to that. <clears throat> so first of all, it was not a statement that CISA issued alone. Uh, it was a statement that was issued by the entire election security uh, community, the people who have been working over the past three and a half years to improve the security of our election infrastructure. Um, folks from the Election Assistance Commission, uh, the Federal Election Assistance Commission, uh, people who represent uh, bipartisan way, the state uh, secretaries of state, uh, the state election directors, the private sector companies that actually provide the equipment for most of the elections. Uh, secondly, um, you know, a lot of the claims that are out there have to do with election fraud, which is beyond the scope of, of the work that we do here in CISA um, and of the work that we have been focused on, on building. Uh, you know, fraud, for election fraud is, is the purview of the Department of Justice and uh, state and local authorities uh, that have the responsibility for investigating and prosecuting that. Uh, and you know, the attorney general has been on record talking about uh, his views on uh, the scale of election fraud during this election, uh, while recognizing that they are continuing to investigate uh, potential potential claims of fraud. So as of right now, we do not have uh, any specific evidence of uh, systems being compromised, uh, but we continue to work with our state and local officials. If they have concerns, uh, we are one phone call away from, from helping them and assisting them. Uh, but I think that there was times when our statement has kind of been misconstrued to say that there were no problems with the election, that there is, um, uh, that it was fraud free. Uh, and that is, that's, that's just not the case. Um, we do uh, believe that it was secure from uh, external interference, uh, which is our mandate. And uh, we're proud of the work we did to, to get to that point. Uh, so uh, I want to stay with the election for a minute longer to talk a little bit about the rumor control website that CISA launched in the run-up to the election. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about what the agency's goals and hopes were for that website and, and what lessons you feel like you have learned uh, out of how that website has been used and the mission that it has uh, fulfilled over the last couple of weeks. 
Sure. So we originally put that website up uh, in uh, the weeks before the election and partially in response to activity that we were seeing from the Iranian government uh, associated with uh, fraudulent, uh, with uh, spoofed voter intimidation emails. Um, and we thought it was a, a, an important way for us to put out accurate information about the security of voting infrastructure that foreign adversaries were attempting to uh, reduce people to, to uh, undermine people's confidence in that voting infrastructure. Uh, and since that time, we have continued to highlight key parts of the process and talk about the security and resilience measures that were either always in place uh, within those systems or we have were been put in place over the past three and a half years uh, to give us greater confidence that these systems perform as expected. Now, again, I think there is uh, we are putting out very broad information about how these systems normally operate, the safeguards that are in place, uh, the laws that govern it, and providing information on where people can get more detailed information. Uh, you'll notice that our rumor control website is not the same as fact checking done by media organizations, which tend to be extremely specific uh, to claims that are made uh, in specific locations and around uh, that have uh, unique circumstances. We're talking more broadly about the overall processes that are in place, uh, the overall safeguards that are in place. That continues to be, I think, important to educate the American public about how these systems work and why they should have confidence and why they should, um, why there should be a high bar for proving that these systems uh, have been uh, compromised. Uh, do you intend to keep the rumor control website going through the Georgia Senate election or is this something where this was a website targeted at the presidential federal races uh, and, and you see it now winding down? So I, you know, what I've told our staff is that our election security mission, uh, particularly associated with the Protect 2020 effort, uh, will continue until all the elections are complete. Uh, we, will we will keep uh, issuing rumor control entries uh, as we think that the situation warrants it uh, and where we think we can actually have an impact. Um, and we'll, we'll do that through the, through the end of this cycle, uh, which hopefully will happen uh, sometime in, in early January. Um, I, I'd be curious if you could talk with us a little bit about, you know, this This is the first election, the first presidential election that SZA has existed for. Um, you know, the agency turned two, two years old last month. Um, I think it was on November 16th. Um, happy birthday. <laughs> and, and I wonder, uh, you know, as you look ahead now, um, what lessons do you take away from going through this presidential election? Um, both in terms of looking ahead to future elections and the election security mission, but then also uh, what have you learned from the security efforts of this election that you can apply to the critical infrastructure role that CISA plays? Sure. So I'm going to hit four areas and I'll try to do them quickly to, to get on to other topics for you. Uh, first is the, the degree of partnership that we were able to build in the election infrastructure community um, and the, the, the auction administration community was incredible. Extremely broad relationships, uh, extremely deep uh, into counties um, and election vendors. And those relationships were essential in allowing us to execute a broad range of activities. Second, we were able to, to dive into that sector, understand how it operated, decomposing it into critical functions, look inside of those functions and understood what systems were critical to the operation of those functions. And then that fed into our operational work to understand the vulnerabilities um, and apply enhanced security uh, practices around those. I would say third is our relationship uh, inside the federal government uh, where we had information sharing that has been second to none in my 15 year history of working at the department. Uh, information being shared between the intelligence community, our national security agency colleagues, cyber command, the FBI with us. Uh, early awareness allowed us to take quick action, get additional information, pass it back to our uh, back to our colleagues at, in the intelligence community and Department of Defense for them to get additional information uh, where they had uh, insights and access. Um, and that cycle allowed us to get ahead of threats. Uh, it allowed us to hunt for activity more quickly. And it allowed this, this to be intelligence-driven 
uh, which it should have always been. Those are some key lessons that we are now applying uh, to our broader cybersecurity work and understanding how do we, um, in an area where we may not have the amount of leadership focus and attention like we did around elections across the entire US government, how do we continue to get as much progress made um, uh, on our mission? And then the fourth is, and this is frankly an area where we're gonna to have to continue to work and this has to do more broadly with disinformation, how, what is the appropriate role uh, for the federal government in countering disinformation? Where can we be that trusted voice and where might we not be able to make um, a, a real difference and how do we rely upon other voices? How do we empower the right people who can counter, uh, counter disinformation and misinformation uh, that's being pushed out there? Uh, I, I want to stay with that last point for a, a second because um, I think it's such an interesting question. You know, one of the things that was, uh, you know, unique and somewhat unexpected was the way that says uh, bit off this countering disinformation role. Um, you know, it was not something the U.S. government traditionally did in past elections. Um, four years ago, uh, you know, when we saw the Russian attack on the presidential election and the Internet Research Agency, there was sort of no capability inside the federal government at all uh, to combat disinformation. And, and, and I wonder, um, particularly around the question of we are, you know, about to go sort of from the, this very heated and fraught uh, election information environment into uh, over the next couple of months, um, presumably a very heated uh, and fraught uh, information environment around the COVID vaccine uh, and the efficacy and the effectiveness uh, of the vaccine and the treatments that are going to be rolled out by the federal government. Um, do you see CISA continuing to play a role in combating disinformation and misinformation around the vaccine? Uh, and, and do you think that actually the federal government should have something like a disinformation czar uh, who has a interagency uh, cross-cutting role to take on big issues like this in the public sphere? So Garrett, I'd say a couple of points. Uh, first is, um, we, I think we, we rolled this out uh, based upon things we were seeing out there. And, and like I said, partially in response to, to Iranian government activity, uh, but we were actually taking some lessons from work that's done by others. Uh, for example, FEMA often has rumor control up during major disasters to dispel disinformation that's put out there uh, relating to the incidents or related to the aid that they release. And they actually operated a rumor control related to, uh, I think they called it fact versus myth, uh, related to COVID early on during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that being said, more broadly, I think this is going to be an important issue for future political leadership to look at. I don't think the U.S. government has yet cracked the code on, um, on the best way of countering disinformation. Uh, and as I pointed out, the federal government may not, federal government may not always be the best option, uh, the right trusted voice uh, on these kinds of, of challenging uh, divisive issues. Uh, and certainly for CISA, I'm just not sure that the cybersecurity agency is, is going to be a trusted voice when it comes to things like vaccine safety. Uh, and there are other people in the government who are better positioned uh, to, to provide accurate uh, information to the American public so that they have confidence in the decisions that are made uh, to approve, for example, uh, vaccines for public use. CISA, though, does have, and you have been playing throughout this year, a very active role in the security and insurance program of Operation Warp Speed. Uh, we've seen reporting just in the last 24 hours, including this morning, about foreign actors, North Korea and otherwise, uh, attacking uh, the intellectual property, attacking the healthcare companies involved in vaccine development. What can you tell us about the threat that we that you are seeing online uh, to the companies involved in in the supply chains involved in the development of the vaccine? Sure. So it it should be no surprise to to people within the cybersecurity community that from the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, foreign nations were targeting vaccine research and development efforts uh, across this country uh, using. Uh, 
variety of mechanisms to, to gather information. Uh, we are seeing that continue to this very day. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why there is uh, a close partnership uh, between CISA, the NSA, the FBI, um, with the Department of Defense and HHS-led Operation Warp Speed to provide as much cybersecurity support uh, to the entities involved in that effort. Uh, and I think in part based upon things like what, you, what was released this morning by, by IBM, uh, that there is more that we need to do to push deeper and further into these supply chains, not just the big companies uh, behind the vaccine, but the companies that are going to be essential uh, to get this vaccine uh, from manufacturing through distribution uh, that last mile to the American people. Uh, so we're going to we're doing everything we can to raise awareness within that community, provide additional cybersecurity services deeper in that supply chain, uh, and ultimately. Uh, our goal is to, to secure that supply chain so that no effort by any foreign nation or other criminal organization uh, has the possibility of, of disrupting this critical healthcare delivery. Uh, how has the need and the partnerships that you've been trying to develop through Operation Warp Speed changed your way of thinking about CISA's role in interfacing with critical infrastructure sectors? I don't think it's changed uh, our how we think about our role. Um, I think it has certainly um, shown us that we need to have uh, deeper relationships with uh, inside critical sectors before the major incident happened. I think my I think our biggest challenge early on during the COVID pandemic was that we were uh, we were not able to as quickly as we wanted uh, get uh, the companies that we saw as highest risk. Uh, the facilities, the hospitals, others um, up on our cybersecurity services because we didn't have enough relationships with the right people in the right places. Uh, so, you know, one of the key things that I've asked the, the head of our stakeholder engagement division is we need to do a lot more stock taking about where our relationships are uh, across all the critical infrastructure sectors because we don't know where the next uh, the next issue is going to be that's going to require us to surge our efforts uh, into that area. And do we have the right relationships at the right time uh, for us to get our services uh, being fully utilized? And so that's really my, has been, I think, one of the key lessons that we've taken out of this process. And, and that, by the way, is some, some of the same lesson effectively that uh, CISA's predecessor, NTPB, learned out of the 2016 election was that sort of starting to try to push back against the Russian attack, uh, DHS at that point didn't have the election level uh, relationships that it needed. Um, so I, I wonder, you know, it, 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 this is obviously a, a hard thing to predict, but if you look at um, you know, the, the failure of imagination that led DHS to realize that it didn't have the election uh, relationships that it needed, you know, now the failure of imagination uh, of realizing it didn't have the relationship in the healthcare sector that it needed. Um, it, what are you sort of thinking about in terms of, you know, where we might see something that we're not prepared for right now threat-wise? I mean, what, as you look across the nation at cyber threats, infrastructure threats, sort of what do you think is the thing that we're not prepared for next? So I, you know, I don't, I don't know that I could give that answer if I could predict uh, the, the the future uh, major incident. Then maybe we wouldn't have it. Uh, that being said, I think partly the challenge is that there was a big difference between elections and kind of what we're dealing with in healthcare. In elections, we literally had no relationship with the election community because it wasn't really on our sector framework and um, hadn't invested time and energy. Healthcare is a little bit different. It has been a sector since the very beginning. We had relationships, but they weren't at the right level. We didn't have the right executive level relationships uh, to actually make a difference uh, during one of those critical times. And so it's less about uh, do we have no relationship in, in some of these critical areas, whether it's in the electric power space or, or in critical manufacturing or elsewhere? It's do we have the right relationships? Can we, can we talk to the right decision maker if there is an urgent issue like a pandemic and, and get them to, to authorize some action, to get them to authorize some partnership and relationship with the U.S. government quickly when we see a potential problem? And so it's more thinking about uh, is the relationship that we have maybe to uh, to to their to their sock 
at a, at a particular company, is that sufficient uh, for what we may need to, to do and engage with that company in the future? And I think in a lot of cases we're seeing from COVID is um, when we're in a really bad day that that one relationship is not sufficient and we need to have multiple levels and we need to do a whole lot more uh, to engage with those companies and to build the depth and strength of those relationships so that we can take action more quickly. Uh, uh, CISA is, um, I'm going to oversimplify a very complex bureaucratic uh, debate that's been playing out over the last couple of years, um, but CISA is primarily what I would describe as a carrot agency. You don't have a lot of sticks uh, that you're able to uh, batter critical infrastructure sectors to do the things that you want them to be doing. And there's been a debate through Congress over the last few years about whether CISA needs more sticks. Um, it, you know, it, administrative subpoenas, other subpoena power, um, th that type of thing. Uh, as you look back over the pandemic, do you feel that there are authorities that CISA should have or could have had this year that would have helped you navigate this pandemic more smoothly? So I think you raised the administrative subpoena question, and that has been our top legislative priority during uh, the past year. And uh, we are hopeful that uh, if we get a National Defense Authorization Act, that the, the authority will be captured in there. But even in that case, it's more carrot than stick. So that allows us to get information from a, an ISP on a kind of vulnerable IP address that we're seeing out um, in, in cyberspace and allows us to, to actually connect that to an individual company that we can go talk to. Now, we still don't have any sticks against that company. We're gonna be showing up there in a voluntary way, uh, asking them to, to close this vulnerability that we've seen and exposed on the open internet. Um, and that that vulnerability in a critical infrastructure has the potential to cause uh, negative downstream impacts. And we want to have the ability to make contact with that company. Today, CISA cannot make contact with a company that has a vulnerable piece of infrastructure on the internet. Um, but again, we don't have the ability to compel that company to make, it, make a change. Uh, but today, we can't even talk to them. Uh, and so uh, we believe still that the voluntary approach uh, that CISA operates in is, is the best one. Uh, you know, there are significant challenges with trying to, uh, to implement uh, regulations in, a, in as dynamic a space uh, as cybersecurity. Um, and we believe that the work that we've done in things like elections prove that if we work in close partnership and provide good value added services, we can have positive impacts even in a, even in a voluntary way. I'm going to try to squeeze in uh, two or three more questions here uh, in the sure. last couple of minutes that, that we have here. Um, you, you have to be one of the longest serving employees in all of DHS. I know you came to the department in 2005. Um, you're also uh, presumably the newest agency head in the federal government. Um, you've been uh, acting director now for, um, I, I think, probably just a, a, a little over two weeks now. Um, and, and I'm curious, as you look ahead now to the presidential transition, um, as you look ahead to the next couple of years uh, of CISA's growth, um, what are you going to be looking for from the Biden administration in terms of uh, where CISA needs to go um, and, and where you're helping to grow? Um, we heard uh, former Deputy Director Matt Travis on Tuesday here at the Aspen Cyber Summit say that he thinks that CISA should be a $3 billion a year agency. For instance, it's about half that size right now um, and, and I've previously written um, uh, about sort of uh, into the size that, you know, the agency writ large uh, personnel wise is about the size of the security staff of JP Morgan. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty small agency right now. Um, and, and I'm curious, you know, what are you going to be looking for from the next administration? Where do you think CISA needs to be going? Sure. So, you know, I think, Aaron, as you said, I've, I've been with the agency for, for 15 years. So uh, I might take a little bit longer perspective on um, what it will take to build, develop, and mature CISA to, to maybe what its full potential might be in the future. And I have no doubt that one day it will be a $3 billion agency. I just can't say today uh, what fiscal year uh, that will fully manifest in. Uh, you know, with that being said, I think that there are a number of areas that I've asked the team to start looking at. Uh, to get the to to be prepared for uh, future political leadership, provide 
and to provide them with some uh, key decision points on, on uh, important parts of our, of our work, uh, including things like the support that we provide to federal agencies uh, to secure the .gov. Uh, we've been operating off of a legacy architecture uh, for a long time, and uh, I believe that it is time, given the uh, changes in how the federal government has been architected, uh, the IT architecture, that it, we need to evolve uh, our capabilities to keep pace uh, with the cybersecurity threats that we're facing. Um, and that's gonna take some new thinking. It's gonna take some probably radical departure from uh, our legacy programs. Um, and, but that's, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have the answer today, but we have pieces of the answer. And I think the next political leadership team, what I wanna be able to present them is kind of, here is the roadmap for how you evolve our capabilities uh, to be where they are. Um, and I think you can replicate that on a number of topics, including things like disinformation, which we discussed, including things like our information sharing architectures uh, that we have put in place over the past uh, decade. There's a lot of areas where I think we need to make um, substantial, substantial changes uh, to how we do business uh, to keep pace with the threats. And, and I think uh, those are going to be some of the important discussions uh, that I want to have with the next political leader. Uh, and let me ask one one final question about how the government structures cyber responsibilities right now. Um, one of the major decision, or one of the major recommendations coming out of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission earlier this year uh, was the idea of creating and, and sort of reinstalling at the White House a national cyber director, um, a position that the Trump administration sort of effectively did away with with the the White House cyber coordinator. Um, the Aspen Cybersecurity Group actually picked up and endorsed that recommendation, its report yesterday um, about a, a cyber agenda for the new administration. Um, and, and I'm curious what you think of, uh, you know, the idea of a national uh, cross-agency cyber director. Um, would that be useful to you? Is that something that you think uh, would be helpful to CISA um, at, at the table in these conversations? Sure. So, uh, Garrett, I, I believe that the official administration's position um, has has not been to support a national cyber director. Uh, that being said, uh, obviously, um, that issue is still being debated within Congress, and we could very well have one uh, a, a recommendation coming out of the out of the National Defense Authorization Act for this year, uh, recreating uh, such a position. Um, I think CISA is ready to work in close partnership with uh, with the National Cyber Director or Cybersecurity Coordinator at the White House, uh, like we had during the, the beginning part of, of this administration and, and during the Obama administration. You know, I think our major concern would be kind of what is the, the scope of that authority and, and do they have uh, the right uh, degree of oversight uh, over all aspects of the cyber mission to, to really pull the community together. I think there are a lot of ways this could be structured where it might not uh, be sufficient to really advance uh, a whole of US government wide cyber mission. So, you know, I think the devil is gonna be in the details and, and uh, I'm eagerly awaiting to see uh, the direction coming out of both uh, Congress uh, this year as, as well as uh, potential future administration. Acting Director Wales, thanks so much for joining us at the Aspen Cyber Summit. No, nope, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Garrett. We'll be right back in just a minute with a great session from Capitol Hill.
Hi, I'm Garrett Graff, the director of the Cyber Initiative here at Aspen, and I am pleased to introduce our final session of the Aspen Cyber Summit today. Uh, John Carlin, the chair of the cyber program, is going to be speaking with three of the Capitol Hill's most uh, intelligent and thoughtful cyber voices, uh, Representative Lauren Underwood, uh, Representative Will Hurd, and Senator Mark Warner. Um, you can find all of their bios and the rest of the agenda at aspercybersummit.org, as well as watch the previous two days of sessions and today's earlier sessions. Um, for a final time today and for a final time during the summit, I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for helping to make this summit possible, along with Blue Vector, SIGPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support and turn it over to my colleague, John Carlin. Sorry, I had a bit of a, a, an audio issue as, as we fit the Cyber Summit. I, I wanna welcome uh, welcome our guests and also to remind folks that the please submit questions and I will try to read them as we get towards the end of our session today. We've just heard from CISA's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Acting Director, and we will have with us today, I think he's joining a little bit later, Senator Warner, who's the Vice Chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Representative Will Hurd, who's in addition to being the co-chair of the Aspen Cybersecurity Group, is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Intelligence Modernization and Readiness and on the House Intelligence Committee, and Representative Underwood from the Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, Infrastructure, Protection, and Innovation. And I thought I'd, I'd start with where we just ended, which is we just heard from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency's Acting Director, CISA, from the Department of Homeland Security. And the reason why we have an Acting Director is that the President fired the Director of CISA, Chris Gretz. And maybe I will start with uh, Representative Underwood and then turn to Representative uh, Hurd, but to see what, what do you make of the firing of one of our lead cybersecurity officials. Well, John, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, really delighted to be here. I want to start by saying that I really oppose any effort to politicize the work of our national security departments and agencies. Our last worldwide threat assessment warned that our adversaries were going to use their cyber capabilities to undermine the United States and advance their own interests. And we know that it, uh, adversaries have used cyber tools to steal intellectual property and personal data and engage in espionage and execute destructive and expensive attacks. And so towards that end, I was really disturbed when C Director Krebs was terminated ostensibly for doing his job. For one thing, CISA's leadership should largely be commended and not punished for their quick work building a strong election security partnerships. But more broadly, I'm concerned about the kind of message it sends to our adversaries when a competent and successful leader is purged from a top security agency. And I hope that Brandon Wales, who you all just heard from, I heard the tail end of his comment, um, will remain in place and provide some stability until the Biden administration names a permanent successor. And I know that Mr. Wales has also spoken um, at you know, the summit. He's been a great partner of ours on the committee, the Homeland Security Committee. And I'm really confident that the hardworking employees at CISA, and especially the cybersecurity workforce who've been chosen to lend their talents to the government security mission, I know that they're going to continue forward. Um, now, we know that there is an NDAA provision establishing a five-year term for the CISA director, and I understand that there were concerns about that in the Senate, so I believe that we're going to be reassessing that in the next Congress, um, but, you know, obviously, the news of the last month was disturbing. Excited to work with Mr. Wales and uh, continue forward. And what about turning, turning to you, uh, Will? You, you were quick to call to congratulate President-elect uh, Biden and curious both what you make of 
of the firing and whether you've seen any evidence in the last month that's shaken your belief that this election was conducted in a free, fair and, and secure manner, which is apparently the comments that got former director Krebs in, in trouble. Well, when when Chris was, was fired, I think my comment was he should have been thanked, uh, not fired for, for being responsible for one of the most secure elections um, we've ever had. There is no evidence to suggest otherwise. And what I find interesting is I helped Mike McCall create CISA. And there was a lot of debates a, a number of years ago about whether we should even have an entity uh, like CISA. And I'm, I'm at least glad that now we're, we're having debates um, about the leadership of it. And, and I think Chris Krebs did an amazing job of taking a new organization that there was a lot of doubts about its effectiveness and turning it into honestly a, a top premier entity um, within, within the federal government. And to do that, and, you know, when the microscope was, was upon him. And, and so I, I think CIS is important. I think Mr. Wales is going to continue that tradition that, um, that Chris Krebs uh, said, but, but ultimately his firing was ridiculous. And, and Congressman, uh, you've, you've, I won't say an island, but there aren't too many others from your party, including those who in the past have been very supportive of CISA, its mission, national security, who have uh, spoken as bluntly as you just did. What, why do you think that is? And is that something that, that can be addressed? Well, I, you, you're going to have to ask them, but my, my philosophy has always been the same, right? I agree when I agree. I disagree when I disagree. Um, I agreed with some of the things President Obama did. I disagree with many of the things he did. And I spoke out and I, I've done the same thing under under this administration. And And I think as as my friend Lauren said in her opening remarks, we should not be politicizing um, the intelligence community or intelligence operations or when it comes to something as important as the integrity of, of, of our vote, right? Um, and, and again, I think, I think Chris Krebs and his team um, should be commended uh, for, for what they did. And we can even talk about Jay Johnson and what Jay Johnson did. I remember, you know, I was the first person to hold a hearing on the 2016 elections before the 2016 elections happened. And I was talking about firing uh, the, the, the kicking the Russian ambassador out of the country. And we were having debates when Jay Johnson said, uh, voting infrastructure was critical infrastructure and everybody freaked out and was like, this is going to be, you know, the federal government taking over the elections. Like, no, everybody, you know, calm down, take a deep breath. Um, and so this is a tradition of, of folks that are actually in the government doing their thing, um, not getting a pat on the back for it. Some of them get in the boot, uh, like my, like my friend. Um, but in the end, this isn't going to, you know, the people that I know that have worked in this are going to make sure they're doing everything they can uh, to keep America safe. And that turns to you, Congressman Underwood, do you, do you agree in, in going to that, uh, the issue of critical infrastructure right now, as has been discussed, CISA has been working cooperatively, but without direct authority, the mandate when it comes to improving election infrastructure and what, is that the right balance? Should we be thinking about a change? What are your thoughts? Well, I just want to pick up on what Will just said, which is all this is about keeping America safe. And we know that we have many of these different um, critical infrastructure designations. Um, even during COVID-19, right, we've seen just these repeated attacks on our healthcare infrastructure, which really had never been the center <laughs> of our critical infrastructure conversations, right? We know that, yeah, it was listed and yeah, they were included, but there wasn't energy and effort and investment, right, and building those capacities. And now during a pandemic, we're seeing some real negative repercussions, even in the headlines today about vaccine distribution and the cyber attacks there. I mean, all of this is connected. And so when I think about CISA and the opportunities moving forward, um, I see two challenges carrying out the mission. One is budget. The budget is limited. And two, as you mentioned, their authorities are really pretty limited. I mean, CISA is responsible with securing uh, the networks of federal agencies, 99 federal agencies. We heard Mr. Rails talk about that at the end. Um, but then they're also, you know, with this billion dollar budget, it just doesn't cut the breadth of what they're supposed to be doing. And so we've been trying to get some additional funding for the agency. We're going to keep fighting to do that. Um, but I do think that in terms of the authorities, uh, we're going to have to just continue to work with our colleagues in Congress, right? Cybersecurity uh, work has been split across different 
committees in the Congress. <laughs> Everybody, I mean, we have jurisdictional problems. Girl, even don't start. Don't, don't, don't start with that word jurisdiction. <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah. it, I mean, it has to be said, yeah. right? So then when we look at the agency, of course, the agency has, you know, some challenges in asserting its own uh, authorities. And so, you know, this is going to be probably a continuing conversation, John, if we're going to be really candid about it. Um, but I think that at least we have the opportunity in forums like this to, to raise these issues. If I can add on that, look, I, I think the, the next step is you have CISA have authority within the .gov space, okay? That is where, where CISA is, is, has, was originally designed to be. Let them focus and have some of that authority on, you know, uh, commerce if commerce isn't doing something right. You know, that is probably the logical place where you can expand, where they have that stick as, as Mr. Wells was, was talking about, because that was, the, that was the goal, was to say, hey, this was the entity that's gonna help make sure you improve this. You also need to make sure that OMB plays a role, and, and we're gonna get a little wonky here on the, on the entities that are involved in this. OMB has some oversight over these areas as well too. And, and so they have to empower folks there because we gotta get beyond. The, the question we should, be the, we should be talking about is, is how are we going to have um, uh, a quantum resilient infrastructure in this country? How are we going to be able to have an infrastructure that's res resilient to general artificial intelligence, right? If the Chinese were to lead on that. And so, so us talking about, you know, Washington gets caught up in, in some of these talking about this one little thing when we forget that this is a freaking war, right? And, and we need to be arrayed as best we can. And we're not going to have enough money to, to, to solve all this. And it has to be in cooperation and partnership with, with people. And we need those folks in the Senate to get to what on the side. We didn't saw Senator Warren and John on. Uh, it's, it's Senator <laughs> Warren is going to solve all these problems. So it's all good. A good, a good hand over to uh, Senator, Senator Warren. And we're glad you're going to uh, solve apparently right now, all of our cybersecurity uh, problems here and into the future, but but welcome. Uh, you joined a little bit late. Let me, as we turn to you, I, I think both of the representatives have, have talked about the fact that it can be difficult getting legislation passed through through Congress, and particularly in this, hold on, hold on, in hold this on. area. John, John, it's difficult to get legislation <laughs> passed through Congress? <laughs> I mean, Will and I only worked for three years on what was like the lowest hanging fruit, IoT basic security in this realm, so. That's exactly where I was gonna go. They see that uh, to quote CyberScoop, Congress just did something it rarely does. It passed a bill, a meaningful cybersecurity bill. And they were referring exactly to that, the Internet of Things uh, cyber bill. I know that, that you and Will were co key co-sponsors and intimately involved and so I turn to you first on what does it do and why does it matter? Well, first of all, I apologize for being late. Um, and Great to see Congressman Hurd and Congressman Underwood, uh, you know, on a non-related topic, um, you know, we are deep, deep, deep into trying to see if we can actually not do something tremendously stupid again, which would be leave for the holidays and not do some level of COVID relief package. So there is an active bipartisan group that's working on that. And we might, we might surprise the country again um, uh, on, in terms of getting stuff done. On IoT, and uh, you, to me, this was an example. It was, thank God it happened, but oh my gosh, it should not have been this hard. We all know people uh, within the Aspen world understand you know, we are purchasing literally billions of IoT connected devices. You know, we talk about 5G a lot. Well, you need 5G to be able to bring all the sensors and IoT connected devices really to their full utilization. If we're ever gonna have driverless cars, it's, uh, it's gonna be based on a lot of IoT devices. Yet the surface space of all these additional devices really add another vulnerability point. So we thought at first that maybe we could mandate across the country. And of course we then pulled back and said, um, could we at least say that if we're going to use taxpayer money and the government's going to be buying these devices, they ought to have some level of de minimis security. Uh, because otherwise we would be out, you know, for all the good we've tried to do with cybersecurity, just increasing our, our surface vulnerability exponentially by literally billions of devices. 
And we had a pretty low standard. I would ask both the Congress members to, to weigh in. It wasn't like we tried to go to the highest common denominator. We went to the lowest common denominator. We said, let's at least make sure they're patchable. Let's make sure there's not an embedded passcode. Let's make sure just the not even great cyber hygiene, but at least minimal cyber hygiene. And what we frankly found um, is that you know the high-end device makers um, were basically okay with this. I was did a call with Microsoft earlier. They they've been generally supportive. The low-end, extraordinarily cheap devices, um, they fought us tooth and nail. Even though the the cost would only be a few pennies. Uh, per device. So we ended up getting there. It took three years and, and um, a lot more effort than, uh, and frankly, it was more on the Senate side of the House. It wasn't really as much the House. I got to give them credit where credit's due. Um, but it does set up a, a de minimis process. And then there were lots of intervening, you know, who's going to be taking the lead. And, you know, there was all these bureaucracy and Congressman nodding on that. And you know, it probably took an extra year, even once we kind of got agreement that this was what we were going to do, you know, who what NIST was going to do, what commerce was going to do, who was going to take all of the, the leads inside government. Is that a fair description or relatively fair? Look, Senator Warner, I, I think it's it's you know, you you're 100 percent right. It's even more basic. Even if you can't patch this thing. You got to have a plan on how to how to defend. You know that that you can still defend uh, those widgets, right? And so this was a this was this was you know like the first letter of the alphabet, you know. Um, and but we we got it done. And 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 this and, and 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 guess what? Legislation is not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy to get things through this place. It was des it's it was a design element of of the system. Um, but when you have smart people. Uh, Robin Kelly, this is, you know, her bill on the House and, and Senator Warner, you can actually get some things done. And, and look, I'm excited. We're going to probably um, pass a, a, a national strategy on artificial intelligence next week. Um, and out of, we had got through six committees. Um, and, and so, uh, so, so th there, there is hope. And it's still, I think this is one of those areas um, cybersecurity in general. I, I would also add the threat of the, the the Chinese government when it comes to global leadership and advanced technology is still a bipartisan issue. And how do we make sure we keep these issues a bipartisan issue? Um, and and like I said, this has been a great area that I've been able to work on the last couple of years. Well, congratulations on a on a bipartisan accomplishment with with the Internet of Things legislation. As you know, uh, Will, it's one we long talked about in the in the group at, at cyber and it, it's a, such an important basic uh, basic step to take. Let me ask you know, more broadly in speaking about a, a theme of areas where we can work in a, in a bipartisan slash nonpartisan way, what, what are you, uh, turning, turning it to all panelists, but what did the Trump administration get right about cybersecurity and the intersection of national security and technology? that the Biden administration should continue? And where are there areas where the, the Biden administration should do something differently? Who do you want to start? I'll, Go ahead. I'll, I'll start it off. So uh, um, look, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the Trump administration, you know, when, when it comes to deterrence, you gotta have capability and will. And, and, and one, of the, one of my frustrations with the, with the Obama administration was never naming and shaming um, some of the actors. And I know there was always uh, that were involved in cyber attacks. And, and so I know there's general attribution versus- versus Never, um, some of us indicted them. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much, John, okay? That was, this was after you left. This was after you left. Um, so so I, I, think, I think the Trump administration um, did a did a good job on, on on that area, and I think that's something that I hope uh, the Biden administration uh, continues. Look, I, I think I think the fact that CISA had the support and the strength that it did throughout its years to get to where it was um, that was um, that was a, a positive thing that that evolved um, that evolved over time, and and I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty confident. Um, that's some, something that um, the Department of Homeland Security will continue under a Biden administration. 
They'll turn to Congressman Under Underwood and then to Senator Warner. Yeah, I think that there's um, not been a, ch I mean, obviously in the last four years, we've seen a real threat from state sponsored agencies and actors across um, the globe. So Huawei and ZTE. And I think that uh, President-elect Biden understands that. And we're going to continue to have a pretty serious uh, standing and posture towards that end. But when I think about, you know, where we can really make a shift. Um, there's a lot of work that we need to do to real, rebuild public trust in government agencies and democratic norms and institutions. And I think that, you know, it's easy to think about just like elections when I say something like that, you know, kind of democracy type language, but I think it extends to the whole mission of um, all the agencies that interact in this uh, cyber uh, arena. And I think that, you know, it's going to take concerted leadership um, an active engagement with um, stakeholders across the spectrum. So not just like the expert stakeholders or just the private industry stakeholders, but like the end user who might, you know, eventually feel the impact of this internet of things, <laughs> right? Uh, advancement that we passed and just roll their eyes instead of saying, well, oh, wait, actually, let's make sure that my data and privacy are being secure. Let's make sure that, you know, somebody's looking out because who knows where my data is going, right? And, and, um, I think right now that there's just like a lot of bitterness, right? A, a lot of people who are just um, fed up and uh, there's just gonna be a lot of work we need to do even in this realm with restoring public confidence and trust. Let me, let me weigh in and agree with both the, my, my colleagues, um, maybe just stated a slightly different way. Um, I think President Trump was directionally right on China. Uh, and I was, you know, I would put myself in the category of, of being wrong. Yeah, you know, I was part of the conventional wisdom crowd. The more you bring China in, the closer they're going to come uh, to us. And when I say China, I think it's always important to say my beef is not with the Chinese people or Chinese Americans, obviously, it's with the Communist Party of China. Um, but I think the implementation um, left a lot to be desired. Uh, it was kind of a hammer, hammer, hammer. And, you know, I think they were right, for example, to move on Huawei. But because we didn't do it with any framework, when the Trump administration moved to TikTok, there was really wasn't a case made. I think we, we, we haven't made the kind of efforts around standards, rules, protocols. We need to have a kind of a comprehensive theory of the case. And to Congressman Underwood's comments, some of that's got to rely on basic trust um, in, our, in our institutions. I think it was a huge mistake that we didn't move on any ramifications for sloppy actors in the private sector. The fact that you know 160 million of our Americans' personal data got stolen from Equifax and there was no penalty, you know, that doesn't encourage and stimulate better behavior. And I think we could have, we could have, um, they could have weighed in there. I think it, it's been interesting that the administration, this a, a tangential to direct cyber, but I think it's important the fact that we're four years in, we still don't have privacy legislation. Uh, around our platforms is is crazy, uh, and you know that we've not done anything. There's a series of bipartisan bills I've gotten in the Senate around data portability or around interoperability or around trying to make sure people knew the value of their data or or the ability to prohibit things like dark patterns. And so the administration never engaged on those issues, and now in the you know fourth quarter with two minutes left, has suddenly made Section 230 total repeal their top issue. That. That's, that's a zigzag approach that doesn't bring the coherence, which also then breeds the trust that I think we will need and have to expect. Because again, as, as Lauren indicated, if we don't make, make, ha have the trust that Americans think, say when we say this stuff, that it really is gonna affect their lives. And it's, we're not gonna say things rashly, but they're gonna be the result of a, a thoughtful approach um, and uh, we, we lose our, our muster. A final thing I guess I'd say is I really believe that the Biden administration, and I'm obsessed about these technology issues, not just cyber, but you know, 5G, AI, quantum, go down the list, that China is winning the battle. Uh, they're setting the standards, they're setting the rules and protocols. They've got this authoritarian capitalism where you know, they have a national champ, their national champion gets 75 to 80% of their domestic market. That's 20% of the global market. They then get back with, 
with the Belt and Road Initiative and unlimited financing, there is no American or even any other Western enterprise that can compete against that under normal capitalism rules. So I think we're going to need this kind of alliance of the willing uh, in the technology space, cyber being a piece of that. Uh, and that's going to look different than previous alliances. It will be five eyes, but it'll also be, I hope, Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore and potentially India and Israel, along with some of our traditional NATO partners. But that's got to be you know, a, a true alliance. It's got to be values-based, and it's going to require collaboration on a lot of these fields. Another question for the group and following up on something Senator uh, Warner said. So if one of the one of the goals for the new administration would be to ensure that there's a, a coherent, centrally driven approach that cuts across a range of issues to try to diminish cybersecurity risk. One of the suggestions has come from the Solarium Commission to create a position that would fill that function. It seems like the National Defense Authorization Act, which might've been one vehicle for implementing that, uh, looks a little less certain uh, perhaps today uh, than it has. So I wanted to just uh, do a, a quick poll through the group. What do you think of that recommendation about a national cyber uh, director? If not done through NDA, do you have other suggestions of how to do it? And are there other key reforms from the Solarium Commission that you would prioritize? And we'll start with uh, Congresswoman Underwood and move to uh, Congressman Hurd and then back to Senator Warner. Yeah, I gotta tell you, so I've only been the chair <laughs> for a couple of months. We haven't quite gotten to that. So I'm gonna defer to my colleagues on the panel. So, so John, uh Having a, a centralized person focus on this, the, the key is, is who's the person, right? You know, we can get a good one. But, but my fear uh, around this particular issue is that everybody should be focused on this. We, we can't just have one person, you know, setting the policy. This, this is too big. It's moving too fast. Uh, we have to have everybody. I, I think removing um, Mr. Painter out of the State Department was probably – a, a, a bigger hit because we need someone building those coalitions with all of our allies or, 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 or around the world on engaging on these norm settings and things that Senator Warner was talking about. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, it's in, in my opinion, six of one, half dozen of the other. I fear that if you have one centralized place, it takes responsibility off of everybody else to be focused on this unless this person is going to crack the whip and make sure everybody's doing playing playing their part so uh the the, the individual matters i think how um you know president biden wants to view his national security staff and and where he wants to put someone i, I think that that is that is up to them on on how to on how to on how to pursue this issue and i think the generally that the um solarium's recommendations were were pretty darn good. Uh, mm -hmm. Angus came and briefed me on it uh, a few weeks ago, but I and, and I don't know. I have them all in the front of my head. I kind of agree though with with Will is that this is a maybe you know, it, it it's dependent on who that person is and how much power is he or she going to have. Because unless they've you know if it you, know, you probably need somebody in the White House who's got this responsibility, but are we going to really empower that person with the enough tools to um, um, to bring all of the public side of the house and the private side of the house kind of to bear. I, I, um, I don't know. I, and I, cyber is, is so pervasive. I had a brief yesterday from uh, a couple of folks in, two days ago from the Intel community that was actually thinking about taking cyber back out as a standalone and kind of placing it back in, in all the various pieces of the, the intel world around you know counter espionage or counterintelligence or back in you know on counterterrorism rather than funneling i um so i'm i'm a, i'm giving a a unfortunately a little too political answer here because i you know it depends on who the person is how much actual power would come with that uh but i am i think will's point of if you if you unless you really make this position very powerful does it take away responsibility uh from all the various other parts of the, the enterprise that need to have this a high priority. 
if if, if no, Chris fair, Krebs fair. or his, his his replacement can't tell someone at Commerce, uh, take that thing, take that widget off the off the digital infrastructure. I think that is a more important thing that we need in order to, to defending digital infrastructure. Now, having someone coordinating this policy, and and if this person is going to be involved in in in, in creating that coalition that Senator Warner was talking about to make sure that the standards and norms are based on our value system that, that Lauren ex- expertly articulated, then, then that's a great idea. And let me just, you know, the closest uh, I, I got to kind of at least a cousin of this is when Richard Burr and I, you know, we got deeper and deeper into the 5G debate and we were trying to get, um, you know, the, all of the working entities from across the federal government, we convened them because nobody in the White House convened them. And it was a lot of, you know, we had Commerce and we had DOD and we had NSA and we had, you know, there was four, uh, NTIA, there was 15, 16, 18 different people at, at, this, uh, at this session. But, and then we con, uh, converged them again, six months later, they'd not done anything because nobody was in charge. Um, and so, you know, are we going to, on cyber, really give somebody the juice to do something? Um, we are going to need this intersection, I think, and, you know, and maybe it's defined even broader than cyber, between national security and between the NSA and the NEC on these convergence issues around technology. Uh, and that may be a model that's also worth exploring. Speaking of one convergent issue, and we've had some, some questions from, from the audience, and this is around the threat that's a little different than, than hacking, I think, and more complex in some ways, which is the threat of mis- and disinformation. And so there's been a lot of discussion about what, what are the special roles of social media companies in, in keeping us safe and in monitoring or policing some of this content. I think the debate started a little bit in the arena of terrorism, where it was easier to define what would be impermissible, maybe harder to implement, how to keep, keep it off of those services, but easier to define. Now that it's moved into a broader range of content, there's been discussion about changing Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, as Senator Warner uh, mentioned, is, is a current priority. And so I wanted to, to open up a little bit as we think about the 117th Congress, where do we think regulation is going to go? in this space? What are the pros and cons to putting social media companies into a position where they're regulating content? Who do you want to start? Uh, I if we could only raise hands, I'd jump all it. But uh, Senator yeah, Warner, why don't you? This, is, yeah. this is what I'm a, little, I'm a little obsessed about. So, you know, because uh, I think I, you know, I like to set, at least set the table on this with, if we look at what the Russians did in 2016, in our elections, if, if what they did in the Brexit vote, what they did so obviously in Macron's in the presidential election in France, and add up all that activity, and it, it was both cyber hacking into information and releasing it, and then disinformation. Add their combined expenditures on all three of those efforts, it's less than the cost of one new F-35 airplane. So this is both effective and wicked cheap and so the asymmetrical value, whether it's cyber attacks or whether it is misinformation, disinformation, is um, um, not going to go away. It's only going to increase, uh, number one. Number two, um, we were totally caught off guard. Our intel community was caught off guard. The platform, the arrogance of the platform companies was pretty stunning to me. Uh, and we've gotten better. And, and folks like the, at the NSA have gotten better. And Chris Krebs obviously did a great job with our infrastructure and um, we maybe didn't have as much foreign disinformation, but we had plenty of domestic disinformation uh, coming forward. So what do we do? I would put on on the social media companies, two buckets. One bucket are these things trying to increase more competition. That's where I put data portability. That's where I put the the detour act in terms of dark patterns. That's where I put letting consumers know the value of their data. And there's a series of other items around that bucket. The other on, on the content itself, I think Section 230 maybe made sense when these were startup enterprises in the late 90s and we thought of them as dumb pipes. There's nothing dumb about the Facebook and Google algorithms that deliver news in some form or another, 65% of Americans. So 
the idea that the 90s framework works in 2020 and 2021 doesn't make sense to me at all. I'm not all the way on full repeal, but I do think, you know, things like these social media companies should not be able to avoid enforcement of civil rights laws. They should not be able to afford, uh, avoid international enforcement in terms of injunctive relief. If uh, the Myanmar troops are killing the Rohingya and there's uh, an injunctive action brought to take things down, I don't think they should be able to avoid as they had with the Grinder case, personal harassment. And I don't think even no matter how much you think about free speech, that that free speech right extends to paid advertising. So there are an areas that we could look at, and then there's a whole question around speech versus amplification. You might have the right to say anything you want, crazy or dangerous, um, but I'm not sure that right should be guaranteed to have it amplified. Uh, and clearly we've already shown with section 230, there are cracks, you know, we prohibited sex trafficking, child pornography, bomb making. Um, I think this is an area that's ripe for additional reform. Thank you, uh, Congressman uh, Underwood. I, I just want to say a couple of things. One, you know, this has really come to the fore because, at least this week, because of a personal grievance from the president. And I think that we just really need to sit with that um, when we talk about um, where can we go with this, because I just don't want this conversation to be tainted because he is feeling personally affronted in this way, right? Like, uh, we have to call it out. Okay. Um, I hope that in the next Congress, the House is going to continue its work on a range of issues. So yes, this is important, but there's so many other uh, relevant technology issues, right? Ransomware attacks, antitrust issues, election security issues, the disinformation that you started out talking about, which is huge. I have my own bill protecting Public Safety Disinformation Act on Homeland. Um, and, you know, I hope that Again, we don't forget, while, especially while we're in the pandemic, what's going on in the healthcare space with these different technologies. It's, it's just the intersections abound. Um, and I think that, you know, with strong partners in the Biden administration, there's, there's a lot that we're going to be able to do. Um, but I do think that with Section 230, um, that we can move forward in a bipartisan way um, across these jurisdictional issues that Will and I touched on earlier to reach consensus on a proposal um, to hold companies accountable and incentivize them to address like actually dangerous content that's proliferating online. However, um, I think that the incentives to get there just, you know, may not always present themselves the way that they have this week because of the president's engagement. So it's real. I mean, <laughs> it's my hope that we really are serious and thoughtful about this in the next Congress. I don't know that that will happen. Before, before President Trump started beating his chest on this issue, uh, the far left and the far right were kind of in agreement and wanting to do something on, on Section 230, even though it was for the exact opposite reason. And, and I, I think now the political life is no longer a line. It's a horseshoe. And the edges are closer to each other. And this is definitely going to be an issue um, on, on in, in the next Congress that is looked at from a, a lot of different ways. But is... is um, Facebook or Twitter amplifying somebody's speech different than, than somebody going on Yelp and saying the pad thai at this restaurant was a little runny, right? And, and, and so, so, you know, the, even the nuance within the various platforms um, and, and what should be covered uh, is important. And, and what's even more difficult, and I think disinformation is, is, is one of the most dangerous things that's happening in our country right now, because are we in a post, post-fact world, right? And so, it, and, and that trust that, that has been eroded that Lauren talked about earlier, part of that trust has been eroded because of people reading and, and is consuming disinformation. Now, there's some basic stuff. We all learned as kids, don't get into a car with a stranger, asterisk, unless it's like Uber or Lyft, right? Why are we sharing information from people? We have no clue who they are, okay? And, and so on some of these platforms, if you can't authenticate the user, should that user be able to talk to anybody, right? Unless it's within your closed network. I think, I think there's, you know, to, 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 to look at smart regulations here, you're gonna have to have people that you, you can't have a one size fits all solution 
ultimately to this problem. And the government's role in this is going to be ultimately limited because how can you say whether something is fact or fiction? Somebody criticizing a vote that I take on a piece of legislation, you know, and it, it, is that fact or fiction when they when they when they abuse that or or, or, or misinterpret that? And and the last thing I would say, and, and John, you led into this question. Uh, you were alluding to CBE, countering violent extremism. We know how to deal with disinformation, the terrorism content, right? Um, but but in this case, when it's directed at um, our, our, by Americans against Americans, right? Uh, this is a form of covert action. And covert action is the responsibility of the, of the intelligence communities. And the intelligence communities are told you can't deal with covert action in the United States of America. So the entities that know how to deal with this information um, shouldn't and can't um, be involved be involved in this in this topic. So who should be leading on this issue? Who should be driving the, the conversation? We need the public sector, we need academia, we need the media to step up. And because because that the trust is not just there's not a lack of trust in just up and down the, the stack in government. It's also the lack of trust in, in, in traditional media. And it's a lack of trust in, in other institutions. So all these folks have to have to come together and, and figure out how we how we rebuild that trust with the American people. And John, can I just add one extra comment here? And I think both what Lauren and Will said, I, I agree with us that this is an area, you know, our inability to come with any rational um, regulation for the platform companies, even as basic as privacy is, is I think the platform companies got so big, so arrogant, uh, and they thought, oh, great, we can take advantage of the dysfunction and candidly, the ignorance of a lot of members of Congress and just push regulation. So instead of our country leading on this, you know, we got the Europeans on GDPR, you got California going with its privacy variation, you got the Christchurch call on content, I, I think you're starting to see, and I see it as basic um, with Facebook on something like data portability, they're all in now because I think they're starting to realize, you know, they got what they wish, no regulation. By the time we do come back and regulate, and we will at some point, the standards and level and the, the type of regulation is going to be much, much more serious than what it would have been a year ago, two years ago, or five years ago. Yeah. And, and, you know, and John, yeah. I, look, look th th this is, you know, uh, private sector is leading in, in, in entrepreneurship and, and creativity. We got to have our electoral, you know, the, the, the public sector uh, to advance as well, because the only way that the, the American economy is going to be able to compete with state-owned enterprises in China is if the public sector and the private sector is actually working together. Oh, and by the way, we got to loop our allies into this also. And, and so, so this is where we have to get this right. And, and look, it starts with the breach law, a national breach law. It starts with, with privacy, uh, because I, I think the next question that we're going to be seeing a lot is, is, is your attention a, a, an extractable resource, right? And it's like, that's a whole, that opens up a whole uh, another, another, another can of worms. But, but we have to remember when we're having these debates, we're in the middle of a freaking race, and the, the, a, a communist government is able to array all their resources in one direction and potentially get to a point uh, quicker. And so this, is the, this has to be in the back of our heads is that we have to deal with these issues now because we want our belief in individual rights and protecting minority rights and human rights. We want that to be what the global standard is. And we know how the Chinese uh, Communist Party is trying to export this their, their know-how and their tactics to, to other authoritarian regimes. Final, uh, well said, and, and final round of, of questions before we wrap up. I think Senator Warner touched on it uh, when, he, when he talked about the ignorance of Congress. And Will, I know you've talked about that as well. And it's not just a problem with, with Congress, right? With boards of director, with senior officials. This is a newer area. It's a technical area. And maybe the last, last lightning round for all three of you, because you've all become uh, taking the time to study and become experts in, in this area. What do we do to get the basic knowledge into the hands of policy makers and to key uh, corporate leaders so that they understand the risks well enough to assess them like they would in other areas or in your case to, to legislate? 
Well, we welcome hearing from all of you on uh, the Homeland Security Sublimit Subcommittee on Cyber Infrastructure Protection and Innovation. You can reach out to us. Like, I want I want to know what people think and you know where we should be going. And you can reach out. Um, my staff is on here, but I'll just give out her email because she loves that. <laughs> Chelsea.blink, like blinking your eye at mail.house.gov. Hit us up. Let us know um, where we should be going for this 117th Congress. Um, and we want to continue to engage with experts, industry experts, private sector, et cetera, as we uh, chart this path forward to keep America safe. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I just John, I'll add and let, and let Senator, Senator close, it up, close us out. Um, we also, we need to be able to pay, Congress needs to be able to pay its staff more. And because, and because and, and cause we want to make sure that we have some, some real pipe hitters on all these relevant committees. And, and we need to make sure that when we're training staff and, and we like if, look, I want more staffers that have a computer science background, a minor in political science or a political science a major with a minor in data analytics uh, coming up and not only working at, at for, for Lauren on Homeland Security subcommittee, uh, the cybersecurity subcommittee, but also at CISA. And, and or they have had some experience in the private sector as well. So creating that cross pollinization where we have staff and, and look, we have, we have, you know, fellows, I have a state department fellow who's amazing, right? Let's get some of these, some, some people that have that experience and get them into the government for two uh, or three years and then they get out and, and, and create that back and forth. But we don't have to, we, we, we need to focus on, on educating individual members. And I'll be, I'll be honest, I'll be surprised at how these members have, have, have recognized the problem, but we need, we need some hard hitting staff that understand these issues. Well, there, there you hear the retiring guy calling for higher salaries for staff. Hey, I voted for it. I voted, I voted for it before. I voted for it before. <laughs> and, and also the, what he also just did was he kind of re, reminded me, you gave us a little compliment there on three years of kind of a, should have been a no brainer getting an IOT bill. Actually, Will and I worked on the national breach law as well. That's one that should have been done six years ago. I think <laughs> many of us started working. So I, I, uh, I agree we need input, as Lorna said. I do think we need more expertise that we can draw on on a regular basis. I think some of this will happen just as we more and more newer members come in. Some of this is less Democrat, Republican, and more age related. Um, but I think if we're going to really uh, have accountability, there's got to be some penalties for failure to meet de minimis standards. I still go back to Equifax. The fact that that, you know, they took a short term bump in their stock price. The CEO kind of resigned in shame, but there was no penalty paid. You know, a year later, it was just built into the cost of doing business. And sloppy cyber hygiene if there's not some penalty on that, and I don't, not sure, you know, whether it's purely a liability standard, I'm not sure I know, but there's got to be some cost of not, not doing the right thing. And that has to be, um, we need to, to put some of those rules in place and industry needs to uh, um, realize that this is, has to be a much, much higher priority than it's been to date. We will end on that note. Thank you to all three of our panelists for a great conversation on with not just important topics, but I think will be the defining topics for our, for our time. And with that, uh, and on that note, we wrap up our three-day Aspen Cyber Summit. We, uh, we hope we'll be back next year in person, maybe thanks to some of the efforts Senator Warner, uh, Warner was just outlining so that we can meet with all of you but I want to thank FireEye, Intel, and Proofpoint for making this week's virtual summit a success and helping us host more than 45 fascinating speakers this week from across the government, the private sector, and academia. We'd also like to acknowledge Blue Vector, SICPA NA, and the American Gas Association for their additional support. And if you missed any sessions, please go to Asper, AspenCyberSummit.org. That's AspenCyberSummit.org to view earlier days and sessions. I know I've had a lot of people uh, firing in questions to see if they can see the recording. You can, it's at aspencybersummit.org. Thank you again for watching and be safe.